morning to those of you waking up in America and good afternoon to our friends across the Atlantic. Hello from the Atlantic Council Studios in Washington, DC, and welcome back to day two of the EU-US Future Forum. My name is Maggie Jackson, Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. And I'm Travis Smith, Outreach Officer for the Press and Public Diplomacy Section of the European Union Delegation to the United States. We are your MCs for this second day of programming to provide key updates, announcements, and weave a thread between the many important dialogues we are glad to present to you on this day two of the EU-US Future Forum. In case you are just joining us now, this forum, EUFF for short, is a unique convening of leaders from both the European Union and the United States gathered virtually to discuss the transatlantic agenda and gain momentum for cooperation. The friendship between the EU and the US spans over 70 years, tracing its foundational roots to a time of global recovery. And here we are today in another time of global recovery. And the transatlantic relationship is just as important to our emergence and future success. Cue this forum. Yesterday, we heard European commissioners U.S. senators, heads of state, professors, CEOs, and journalists discuss these themes with a particular emphasis on reflecting on the foundations and history of this longstanding friendship. In case you missed any of these discussions, they are available on the Atlantic Council's YouTube channel. But don't go looking for them just yet, for day two consists of a lot that you do not want to miss. Today, we will be exploring a post-COVID world and dipping into conversations surrounding transatlantic cooperation amidst this recovery. Within this framework, we'll touch on how the European Union and the United States can work together to form a new economic resilience in the after aftermath of the pandemic, with perspectives from both the public sector and the private sector. This will naturally expand to discussing how the transatlantic trade relationship can be a backbone of success for both the EU and the US. We'll also speak about local recovery through the eyes of cities and the role the green transition plays in emergence from COVID-19, while also discussing transatlantic cooperation on China, space, and climate change. Join the conversation on social media using the hashtag EUFF2021. And remember, you can still register for the event at AtlanticCouncil.org to download the Atlantic Council event app. Here, you'll find the complete agenda with live streams, detailed speaker information, and up-to-date announcements. To kick off day two, we are delighted to welcome Ed Luce, the US national editor and columnist at the Financial Times, who joins us in dialogue with Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, here to discuss reimagining post-pandemic economic resilience. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that. It's a great pleasure to host this um, opening session to your second day of this very important conference. And it's a great pleasure in particular to be here with uh, Thierry Breton, the um, EU Internal Markets Commissioner, which for those of you who aren't uh, as familiar as you might be with the workings of Brussels is a bit like being um, head of the FTC, the competitive uh, com competition arm of the DOJ, parts of the Treasury, parts of the SEC. It's a very important role, in other words, and, and particularly in the context of these big issues that the Biden administration wants to address transatlantically. Competition policy, resiliency post-COVID, global supply chains, China, and so forth. Uh, Monsieur Breton was a former French finance minister, um, uh, a former um, chief executive of France Telecom. So uh, uh, a lot of experience both in the private sector and in government. Um, let me start um, though, Monsieur Breton, being a journalist with the news um, of the last 24 hours, which is the Biden administration's, um, to some people, quite surprisingly emphatic decision uh, to announce that it was going to seek waivers on the patents for um, COVID vaccines to, to have a TRIPS um, waiver. Now, of course, that's got to command consensus at the WTO. And the position um, of European countries in the EU, I believe, is still in favor of retaining patents. Are you going to work with um, Biden um, and Catherine Tai, the US trade representative, to get these 
um, waivers through the WTO quickly? So thank you very much. And uh, first of all, uh, good morning uh, to, to, uh, to everyone. And I'm extremely happy to be, uh, to be with you. I'm dying to come uh, to come in the US back because I miss I miss my trips uh, uh, there. But uh, hopefully very soon we'll be able to do this live and uh, and uh, on one side or the other one of the ocean. But still, um, that's a very important uh, uh, question. Uh, we have been always clear, and I have been personally, as you know, I'm also in charge of the vaccine because I'm I've uh, I've been tasked uh, early February to be the head of uh, EU task uh, force for vaccine. A little bit with my counterpart, you know, in the US, uh, uh, this is the same position, uh, more or less, than the, the one uh, that uh, uh, Jeff Zions uh, hold uh, in this uh, topic. So I have been always extremely clear. First, it was a matter of science. And it's unbelievable, but we have been able to uh, 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 develop vaccines which are working in, uh, in, in, in few months. By the way, I just would like to say that it is a, a, a cooperation between Europe and, and, and the US. Most of the vaccines uh, which are working today has been developed and financed uh, uh, thanks to uh, European research, uh, Tech uh, uh, BioNTech, Tech Corevac, Tech Oxford, uh, Tech Janssen. They're all European uh, labs, European researchers. And the good thing is that uh, they're working. But then of course, thanks to the BARDA, uh, the U.S. has been able to put a lot of money and uh, and 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 help to accelerate uh, the rollout, the development, and rollout of this uh, European research, and that's very good because this is a cooperation, definitely. And people don't understand that, but it is a cooperation between EU and the U.S. And by the way, this cooperation between EU and the U.S. will be the one, I believe personally, which will help us. Um, how to, how should I phrase it? Yes, to save the world. So the second phase now was to increase the capacity, the production of the vaccine. And this has been a very difficult task. Uh, I'm monitoring myself with my team, the task force, 53 factories in Europe uh, are working uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, to make sure that we can ramp up. By the way, we are today probably the first continent we produce a bit more vaccines than in the US, but it's good. Um, but we had a different uh, of politics, and I don't want to, again, to, uh, to, uh, to, to discuss anything, and I understand everyone. Uh, in the US, um, um, the administration established uh, uh, an executive order uh, to say that until um, the herd immunity will not be reached in the US, not one single dose will leave uh, the US. And I can understand that. Our philosophy was to do it for us, but also to help the world. And, and we have been producing both for us and half of our production for the rest of the world. In other words, uh, all our allies, all the NATO allies, we do it. All Israel, we do it. All Japan, we do it. Uh, Canada, we do it. Mexico, we do it. So in other words, this was our philosophy. And by the way, um, uh, I said many times to my friends in the US, look, as soon as you can, it will be good that we do it, uh, both of us. Uh, but so far, we are still the only one. But now I was clear to answer to your question to say, look, when we will have enough ramp up to make sure that we will be able uh, to have the facilities and the supply chain and the global supply chains working globally in order to be able to sustain the facilities, it will be time to open the discussion of the patents. Because, you know, uh, um, uh, we are now entering into a new phase probably we will reach herd immunity at the same time, more or less, in the US and in Europe, probably during the summer. But both of us, we represent only 10% uh, uh, of the planet's population. So we need to sit very quickly. And now uh, I always say that when we will reach this, it will be time immediately to see first how to accelerate uh, the rollout with existing vaccines. Because you know, to make a, fa a factory, starting from scratch, when you give a patent, and then to have the, the, the first vaccines to be ready, it's, let's say, many months, probably one year or one year and a half. So it means that it's time now to think how, with our production, we can immediately increase drastically the help and support for all other countries, like Europe is doing now, but we, want, we don't want to be alone here, including through COVAX or other, or other tools. And then, of course, to start to discuss for the next phase, which will be how to accelerate this for the world 
with uh, uh, this uh, proposal that we that is coming now at the right time for the waiver of the patent because we know then that it will take probably another year or so to build the facility. But in between, who will bridge Europe and hopefully soon okay. US with it? And that's accepted. And I think people understand that Europe's um, vaccinate sent as many doses outside of Europe as as it is put into European arms inside of Europe. But let me just understand your answer. Um, clearly, this TRIPS waiver that the Biden administration now supports is only going to be effective for precisely the reasons you set out. It takes a year or so to build a plant and to transfer the technology. It's only going to be effective if it's done and agreed at the WTO at very high speed. Uh, well, regardless of the complexities, are you? Edward, no, that, that's a very good. That's a very good question. We, we, it's important to sit now. It's important also to realize for everyone that uh, was listening to us that, that these patents are mainly European patents. This is maybe why you heard and, and, and not elsewhere. That maybe you heard some noise. But at the end of the day, I really think that now it is the time to sit together and to discuss this and to go into your direction. Yes, quickly. You know, uh, uh, and I'm always was consistent and I always said. When we will make sure that we will be certain that our productions will be able to reach the level that we need. For example, for us in Europe, we will be probably between three to four billion doses capacity uh, uh, at the end of this year. Three to four billion doses, which makes, of course, that now we, we, we know that we, we were able we have been able to reach this without destabilizing uh, uh, the, the, the ramp up and, and the supply chain. So now I could tell you, yes, the supply chain now are solid. Uh, the ramp up is effective. So yes, it is a time to do it. And personally, I think we, we will. Uh, it will be good to do it uh, to do it quickly. But uh, but but as I said always, everything at a time. No, okay, uh, that that's that's clear now. Um, I want to move beyond vaccines in a second, but let me just very quickly ask you. What went wrong at the early stages of the procurement negotiations by Brussels? Because you were later than America and Britain, and that did cause a lot of controversy. What went wrong? How did the how did Brussels mishandle this? Personally, I should say to you one thing: the contract with AstraZeneca. Everything went extremely well. We signed the contract with AstraZeneca, Oxford. Um, uh, let me start even more. Um, 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 at, at the beginning, Oxford uh, research uh, 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 scientists have been able to, to produce uh, uh, adenovirus vaccines, and they wanted to uh, to, uh, to get, uh, let's say, married, if I may say so, with Merck, the, uh, the vaccine company, because uh, of course, no one. It's interesting, by the way, when to, to understand my answer. Not one single company today working uh, um, uh, was a big pharma. BioNTech was a German company. They had to select somebody knowing how to uh, manufacture a vaccine. They selected Pfizer using, using uh, uh, this European technology. Same thing for Curevac. Same thing for Jensen, which is a Netherlands company, and then, of course, linked and, 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 and bought by, by uh, GNG to produce it. Same thing for, uh, for um, uh, um, AstraZeneca, I mean, Oxford, selected Merck first, and then the British government decided that they wanted to have AstraZeneca AstraZeneca, as you know, had uh, its headquarters in London. That may be one of the reasons, or maybe the reason. Uh, unfortunately, AstraZeneca had no expertise in vaccines. But still, um, um, uh, uh, so we signed the contract a little bit before the uh, UK, and we signed for 120 million doses for Q1, 2021, and 180 million doses for Q2. And unfortunately, uh, uh, for reasons we are in investigating now, uh, um, AstraZeneca delivered only, only 25%, 30 million in Q1, while we understand that it delivers everything for, 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 for the UK. And uh, for Q2, 70 million instead of uh, 180. So we had to, to correct this very quickly, and we did it with my team, and of course with the support of the company, because all others uh, uh, name it, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, BioNTech and Pfizer, uh, Moderna too, uh, deliver, over deliver, uh, worked extremely hard. And now uh, we are exactly uh, at, at the same speed as the US. We are catching up. Uh, but of course, uh, if uh, um, AstraZeneca had delivered uh, the way they delivered for the UK, which was planned, uh, we, will, uh, we will be probably 
I hate to compare us, you know, this has no, no, no signification. Uh, uh, in French, we call it the, uh, the fable, le lièvre et la tortue. Uh, you know, you start slow or you start quickly. At the end of the day, what is important is that we will land probably exactly at the same speed that others, maybe maybe a little bit more advanced. But this is what went from. And then, of course, uh, uh, we organized also ourselves to help to help all industrial companies, as it was part of my duty, to make sure that the supply chains were working well. To tell you, to give you an example, uh, we, are, we had with the executive order, which has been um, um, put in place by the, uh, the US administration, um, uh, it was uh, difficult, uh, if not uh, forbidden, in, including uh, to send some components. And you know, to make a vaccine, you have 500, 400 to 500 components. So I had to engage also to make sure that supply chains were working. We had a lot of delays because of this uh, ban, but thanks to the good willingness that we have been able to establish, finally, it comes smoothly. And now, of course, okay. we are catching up, but we are, I believe, exactly at the same speed as others, including by the US, our US fund, which is good again. Huh? Okay, well, so the many components of the supply chain to produce vaccines is a very good sort of um, uh, dropping off point to get into the larger topic of um, resiliency in global supply chains post pandemic, which I know is one of your focuses and of yeah. the focus of this discussion. Um, not just vaccines, semiconductors, um, which is we've been seeing shortages of um, in, in the last few months, causing all kinds of downstream complications in the car industry and elsewhere. Uh, Europe, I believe, only has 10, 12% of global semiconductor production. In order to be resilient or have strategic autonomy, you're going to need a much higher share than 10, 12% of um, what Intel or what the Taiwanese produce. How are you going to do that without throwing massive subsidies at them uh, and opening yourself up to charges of protectionism? That's a very good question. You know, it's uh, it's interesting because last week I was with, uh, uh, here in Brussels with my, one of my old friends, uh, the chairman, the CEO of Intel, uh, Pat Gezinger, yeah. and uh, and uh, I invited him. So we spent the day uh, Friday, last Friday, here in Brussels to discuss, of course, strategy and so on. Um, uh, so that's interesting because we are comparing our both our strategy. Uh, 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 could you imagine that 20, 25 years ago, we were building in Europe 40 to 45 percent of the global world pro uh, uh, production needs in semiconductors. And now we are exactly at 9%. Right. The US were a little bit less, and now the US are at 11%. So both of us, we are 9% in the EU, 11% in the US, roughly same thing, 10, 10. And we said that in our strategy in the, in the uh, uh, EU, our goal is to go back to 20%. We believe it is our fair share in, in the next 10 years. And we compared the strategy of the US is to go uh, from 10% now to 30%. So roughly, we are here in parallel regarding uh, uh, our weight in the global economy. Of course, we, we, we recognize that there is this chip act in the US with 50 billion of public money, uh, which will be put, of course, uh, uh, for American companies in the, in, the, in the US. And I think it's very important because you need to invest a lot. So for us, uh, uh, we will um, uh, we will act uh, uh, with uh, some of of course of our uh, plans the next generation EU that we 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 we, we uh, insisted to um, to have uh, what we create uh, we call an alliance between uh, semiconductors so the alliance will be between uh, the European semiconductors then we are defining now our strategy in other words to go roughly to be able to 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 um, to produce. And uh, um, the specialist will will follow me hopefully uh, between uh, let's say uh, 22 to 10 nanometers within the next few years, including with um, uh, manufacturing sites. We have already that we want to increase manufacturing sites to go. Now we are roughly in average at uh, between 20 to 30, so 22 to 10, and to discuss together uh, to invite uh, a partner. So we are discussing now, of course, to be open, but of course at our condition, like in the US. We are an open continent, but now we establish our condition, and then we will invite the one uh, who will uh, uh, be able to um, uh, to uh, to benefit, or we are willing to benefit uh, from our market at our condition. And we have uh, not too many players, 
so we are working on this and we, we hopefully will be able to be very clear in the next hopefully few few weeks because I, I, I want to be very, very, very quick here. But of course, what, what is important and to understand um, for, 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 for everybody today is that we are definitely an open continent. All my life, I worked in both public and private sectors and I'm always uh, uh, make partnerships. It is what is um, the business about. But in order to make a good partnership, you need to know exactly what you are, where, you, where are your strengths, what is your strategy, and then, of course, invite your partners uh, to go with you. This is exactly what Europe is doing now. Well, so um, you know, to put it crudely, if you, were, if you were to ask the average sort of person in Washington or policymaker in the United States where Europe um, sort of leads the world, the answer would be regulation. And so there is a suspicion that Europe, you know, is trying to find a strategy um, to produce national champions or continental champions, I guess, that would um, that would compete with big tech um, from from Silicon Valley. Um, why does Europe lack its own sort of big tech um, companies? And is more regulation the way you're going to emulate America? Oh no, no. Uh, I think I think that's a very fair question. But uh, we have to be very, very bit more precise when you when you when you mention big tech. In fact, when you mention big tech, you're mainly mentioning roughly uh, the so-called GAFAM, maybe. Uh, that's more, usually that's what people have in mind, and it's, and, and it's very clear uh, here. Um, uh, I know, you know, I, I spent half, half of my life uh, uh, in the US, so I, 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 and, 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 and I really know uh, um, uh, everything, including, by the way, and I, I want to say this extremely openly, uh, not naively, but openly and, and respectfully, I know exactly also uh, uh, the role of, um, let's say, um, um, uh, the uh, the Pentagon and, uh, and 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 in terms of, or including by the way, in semiconductors. And I respect this. Uh, I was running companies in the US too. Uh, it was uh, always forbidden for me, unfortunately, to be able to bid with many contracts. And I respected. It. I respected it. It was a one way to close, and I respected. It. So for us, it's different. Uh, uh, we don't have this uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, well established in the US, but um, uh, we, we invite our partners with, again, now our, our own rules. It's not protectionist. It's just to make sure that we will be able to secure what is important to us. Let me give you an example. Uh, we, were, we were speaking about vaccines. I mean, we had uh, partners and, 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 and a lot of partners, especially in the US, and suddenly executive order. Close the, close, the, close the supply chain. We need to make sure that with our partners, including the one uh, who are in the US, we can continue to work uh, without any impact of an, of an executive order. Same thing from the Chinese. We have now, uh, um, um, uh, we put a lot of our factories in China. When I was a CEO, I did it also myself. So I, it, was a, it was a trend. Uh, uh, and then because of the tensions between US and China, which we lost, and that we are on, and we know where we are, by the way, huh? We know, we know who, 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 who is our ally. Huh? Uh, this is the US and for decades. So we, we don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We know exactly who are our allies. And by the way, the Chinese are considered as our uh, systemic rival. But still, because of the tension, close for the semiconductors, then we have a tension in semiconductors. China is spilling stocks. And then we have our supply chains here in Europe uh, in manufacturing mainly for automotive, uh, which which stopped. So we need to make sure, of course, here, even with our partners, that we'll be able uh, to, uh, uh, whoever they are, to secure the supply uh, in certain areas. That's it, not more and not less. Now for the GAFA, the question is already was very vocal. I don't want to take too much time on this, but it's true that uh, it has been a fantastic um, development, um, the GAFA in the US, mainly because in the US, we have this fantastic uh, large pool of personal data, and it has been made of personal data. Uh, 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 so it's not about regulation for me. It's just about now not missing. We missed, that's true, in the US, in, in Europe, as a first wave, mainly uh, because we are, we, are, we are, of course, uh, 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 very fragmented still, uh, yeah. uh, especially for personal data. Yeah. But now the new wave is in industrial data. And Europe is extremely strong in industrial data, probably the first continent. So my mission, my job is to make sure that we will not miss this, uh, this wave 
And this is what we are, what we are trying to do, us, and of course, with our allies, and of course, with uh, other companies. So we are establishing uh, our, our rules, guidance, and we welcome everybody uh, uh, fulfilling the fact that, especially for data, for example, uh, the laws uh, uh, which will be applied on, on European data will be European laws, but not um, not okay. from other uh, uh, continents. And you understand. Okay, I mean it's a very important topic, and we've just touched on it. But I, I'm glad you mentioned China um, because, uh, as you know, um, you've negotiated an investment deal with China that uh, you concluded shortly before the Biden administration took office, and it caused some irritation. The timing caused, uh, and the fact of it, to cause some irritation this side of the Atlantic in Washington. Um, and now that, that deal's got into trouble, partly because of the sanctions you imposed on China, and then China really doubled down and imposed a quite harsh sanctions on Europeans. Um, is this deal now dead? Well, you know, I, I will be very honest with you. This deal was not exactly a deal. So that's why, uh, um, and we all understand, I don't want to comment. I mean, uh, um, uh, you, are, you are a professional uh, 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 journalist. Uh, I am a professional in my side, hopefully. Uh, so I don't want to, uh, to comment more than, uh, than, uh, than, than uh, what uh, my body language will say. But what is my body language saying? My body language is saying that it's not a deal. It was more an intention. And it's true that we could uh, decide to do it before or after. It's true that it was exactly uh, uh, in, the, in the interim time in the US. It's true also that I understand that probably uh, it was also under the German presidency. And, uh, and it was probably something you remember that uh, uh, before the COVID-19 uh, crisis, I think uh, the Chancellor Merkel wanted to, um, to have a, a, a big meeting a big, uh, with China and then thing and finally it didn't happen. So put this in perspective at the end of the day, what it is, it was an intention, okay? Uh, not more, uh, not less. Now we have, of course, uh, uh, everything that you uh, mentioned uh, in, in China, European Parliament is, uh, is, uh, is, is on it. So uh, uh, um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the time uh, uh, when the intention will transform into reality may be pretty long. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad also that you mentioned the German presidency. Um, 2020, I think I'm right in saying, was the first year where EU trade with China was bigger than EU trade with America. Um, and of course, if you look at the breakdown of that trade, Germany really dominates. Um, I mean, there is a sort of German interest there um, that exceeds the rest of the other 26 members combined. It's a, it's a very lopsided EU-China trade relationship. There is some um, awareness, uh, again, this side of the Atlantic, that there are divisions of um, opinion, differences of opinion in Europe about the degree to which the EU should cooperate with the Biden administration on forming a common China strategy. Is that a correct supposition, particularly in advance of, you know, very important German elections, federal elections later this year? Well, let me tell you for the spirit. The spirit, first I would like to mention that um, um, uh, in my portfolio, I will speak more comfortably in my portfolio, which is very large huh, because it is again all uh, industry, uh, companies, uh, digital, defense, space. So I have many, many areas where, uh, where, where, where I want to, to cooperate and, uh, and interact much more with the US. And the US, we already do. And I did it, I would like to tell you this I did it already uh, uh, pretty good with the previous administration because it's my job. My job is to make sure that we continue uh, 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 to do it, uh, um, whatever happened. And I should here tell you that I had very good relations with my counterpart, and we tried to do things positively for both our uh, continent. But of course, I should tell you also that now with the new administration, there is a, 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 a very strong uh, uh, hope, I should say, that we will continue, we'll be able to increase this even more. And, uh, and, and, and of course, I, I, I'm one of those, of course, you could understand that. So we have many, many uh, uh, aspects where, where I think it's very important to cooperate even more. But you know, as I told you, in my life, I spend my life to make partnerships. 
this is what is building. Uh, I mean, any CEOs who are looking at, and I, I run many, many, I mean, not many, but uh, four or five big companies in my life. Uh, you mentioned one of those, but, uh, but uh, I, I run others. Um, uh, I teach us also uh, governance, uh, corporate governance at, uh, at, uh, at Harvard Business School for, uh, when I left the government. Uh, so, so I always said, you know, partnership is extremely important, but to be a good partner, you need also to, to have something to exchange. Uh, and, and this is why um, uh, you, you, you could be certain that you could count, and US could count on us to be a strong partner, a good partner, and the stronger we will be, the better partner we will be. Now, regarding uh, the relation uh, that you mentioned between um, uh, uh, US and, and EU uh, versus China, personally, uh, I have been the one uh, who went to uh, find a solution for the 5G uh, uh, and 5G toolbox, and I did it, uh, uh, preserving our interest. Uh, uh, I encourage you to look uh, what we did and what I did uh, uh, in order to make sure that we, we, we will be able to have um, uh, clean networks. Uh, 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 without any, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, uh, risky partners or, or suppliers. Uh, so uh, we know how to do it. We will continue to do it uh, uh, our own way. But, uh, uh, but we know extremely well uh, who are our allies. OK, I mean, I, that's a very, very interesting question. I mean, if you, if you talk to um, other countries, I mean, not just European, but partners of America around the world. They say when the United States says, please drop Huawei, um, they, their response is, sure, we're happy to do that. We're your partner. Um, who do you have as a substitute for, for, for Huawei? And I guess the problem is that Ericsson and Nokia are considerably more expensive. So um, as a last question, because we're kind of running out of time, but it's a huge, hugely important one. Is there any prospect of a transatlantic Huawei? No, but first, I mean, at first, I don't speak of any companies in my position. So I will not mention any names, and I never mention any names, except to tell you two things. Uh, um, uh, we have now put a, a tool in place in Europe to make sure that uh, when a company is, is competing with our European companies, uh, the company, we, are, we want to make sure that the company did not benefit from any state support. That's a very strong, and by the way, we announced this, or we increased this even yesterday. So that's a very strong statement to have the first uh, aspect of your question. The second one is that we put very strict restriction in terms of protection, cyber protection. Never mentioning anyone, but just saying, look, if you want to come, like I said at the beginning, if you want to benefit from the internal market, which is the largest market in the world, you're welcome, but here are our conditions. You fulfill the conditions, welcome. You're not, not welcome. And by the way, from, from uh, 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 some, uh, some uh, uh, 5G suppliers, including the one you mentioned, they have been considered as high-risk suppliers. So now uh, uh, we have, of course, the, the two other European uh, companies, Ericsson and Nokia. Uh, they hold the largest uh, uh, number of uh, uh, patents uh, in uh, 5G. We want to continue to develop it. By the way, cooperating with US will be a, a, a very good idea. Uh, because, of course, we share the same view, we share the same value. But remember, uh, here also, that's a little bit like the vaccines. Um, the other alternative uh, 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 from Chinese suppliers are coming in 5G from Europe. Yeah, well, that, that's a very interesting note on which to end a discussion. We covered a lot of ground, and I'm hugely grateful for your um, time and insights, Commissioner. Thank you very much, and thank you to be with you. Thank you. Uh, that was a great session, Ed, and, and Commissioner Breton, that's fantastic. Good morning from this side of the pond, the pond that unites us all from the Atlantic Council headquarters in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon to all of those joining us from Europe, and welcome to listeners elsewhere in the world. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and thank you for joining us on this second day of our EU-U.S. Future Forum, uh, and what an extraordinary first day we had. Yesterday, we highlighted the transatlantic ties that bind, focusing on the history and values that unite us in the digital age. 
be sure to check out some key portions uh, of this uh, interesting conversation from yesterday on our website, uh, AtlanticCouncil.org, including a discussion between Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and a uh, historian and a good friend of mine, Timothy Garton Ash, on transatlantic values, where Secretary Albright stressed the necessity of the EU to Americans, underlying the whole purpose of the EU-US future forum that we understand how important we remain, or perhaps even are more than, more than ever before to each other. Uh, we had four back-to-back -back sessions on transatlantic digital policy, technology, and democratic values in the digital age, a set of issues at the core of the dialogue between uh, the EU and the US. Speakers asserted that we should focus on, quote, democratic autonomy, unquote, rather than strategic autonomy, and that we should make, uh, a quote again, make digital the next coal and steel, looking to uh, this year's anniversary of the uh, European coal and steel community. One highlight was an intriguing conversation between European uh, Commission Vice President Vera Yourova, uh and uh, Senator, U.S. Senator Chris Murphy on how to defend democratic principles and resilience in a digital age. Also, be sure to listen on the conversation uh, between President of Estonia, Kersi Kaljulaid, and Senator Jean Shaheen, two of my favorite leaders, where they stress the need for transatlantic solidarity in pushing back against Russian and authoritarian powers in our foreign and defense policies without forgetting to invest in people, economies, and infrastructure on the home front. So it was all powerful stuff. Today, we turn to focus on the economic perspective. We just heard from European Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton, and now I have the privilege of sitting down for a discussion with one of the world's premier business leaders, Guillaume Faurie, Chief Executive Officer uh, of Airbus. Uh, so Guillaume, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, there is, I think, some rich uh, symbolism of having you join us after Commissioner Breton of France, a Frenchman, and the head of the German Green Party, who will follow Annalena Baerbock in her first interview since she was chosen as the party's candidate for chancellor. I'm delighted that we're going to talk about the transatlantic economic relationship as a driver for recovery from the pandemic, and also how your company has weathered a crisis that's hit your industry uh, rather hard. Uh, so Guillaume, and I'll make this introduction short, uh, Guillaume has been the CEO of Airbus since 2019. He's a member, and we're proud to say that, of the Atlantic Council's International Advisory Board. Uh, Guillaume, your love of flying and aviation dates back to your childhood, as I understand it. And what's more, uh, he is even a qualified light aircraft pilot and helicopter flight test engineer with 1,300 hours of flight experience. So with that, uh, I think that should elevate our conversation. Um, uh, I encourage everyone to follow along in the discussion by using the hashtag EUFF on Twitter and asking questions via our Atlantic Council events app, uh, which you can download from either the Apple app marketplace or Google Play uh, store. So with, the, with that, Guillaume, let's begin. Uh, and thank you again for joining us for this forum. Um, first, maybe a bit of a situation uh, report. Uh, you're more the expert than I am, but it seems to me that COVID-19 is the biggest uh, crisis the modern aviation history, uh, industry has ever faced. And perhaps for Airbus specifically as well, can you talk about that and also how, how you've adapted? So first of all, uh, good morning, Fred. It's, uh, it's my privilege to be uh, with you uh, this morning uh, on, on your side of the pond. Uh, indeed, uh, you're right, COVID-19 um, has been for the aviation the, the biggest crisis ever uh, since the outset of this great industry. Uh, it's been brutal um, and even more brutal that, that we were in a big ramp up at that time um, our supply chain ourselves were investing for more production moving forward. And uh, we had to face the brutal reality of uh, the vast majority of the commercial planes around the world uh, being grounded um, more than a year ago. Uh, we started by uh, trying to face reality as good as we 
could. At that time, we worked on scenarios trying to understand how long the crisis uh, would last. I have to confess, uh, probably March last year, we didn't think uh, we would still be uh, in that situation today, more than a year later. Uh, so we worked on scenarios and we decided very quickly to reduce our production by 40%, assuming that deliveries would recover to a certain extent and then match uh, with this uh, new production rates. We worked with the supply chain to reorganize everything uh, to fit with this uh, uh, new um, uh, level of production. We worked with all our customers around the world to try to understand their new situation, uh, how to defer planes, to adapt uh, uh, pre-delivery payments. And it was a, a hell of a lot of work, basically, to try to rebuild everything. We had as well to protect our employees, um, find new ways of producing planes uh, with the COVID-19 constraints. And I would say after our first half of the year where we lost a huge amount of money, uh, we stabilized the situation in the third quarter and we started to make uh, money again in the fourth quarter and uh, in 2021 as well in the, in the first quarter. Obviously having reduced um, our expenses very much, we have also reduce the workforce, but we have found ways to sort of uh, limit the impact of the, the pandemic and the crisis on the workforce. And we are now prudently looking at uh, end of 2021, 2022, uh, with the potential to uh, start to ramp up again from that low point uh, for uh, what we call the single line. So the, uh, uh, the narrow body planes for the long range planes and for the long range business for airlines, we think the tipping point will probably not be uh, before mid of next year, uh, as the different countries of the world, the different regions of the world are really uh, managing the situation in very different ways. It will take a lot of time to, to reopen. So that was last year. Uh, I have to say the solidarity of the supply chain of uh, aviation has just been amazing to try to go through that crisis, to weather the storm together. And we are slowly but surely um, uh, making progress uh, with the hope that uh, aviation uh, air traffic will start again to pick up, uh, moving closer to uh, summer 2021. Th thank you so much for that fascinating opening answer. Uh, looking to uh, a ramping up of uh, some sort uh, on shorter range uh, at the end of this year, early next year, and then longer haul middle of next year. But you did talk about how um, the pace is different in different places. And the United States at uh, this point with vaccination seems to be far ahead of Europe. Um, uh, the full return to flights seems to be coming here faster, but we also see trends in India and otherwise uh, other places that could make us a little nervous about that. Um, what will, and, and, and also news on this side of the Atlantic, this side of the pond, Guillaume, uh, of deliveries to JetBlue uh, that I've read about Airbus and last uh, way it went. So the US is ordering and taking delivery of new planes. What is it going to take to get Europe back? And in general, uh, as you're seeing the new variants come out of COVID, how worried are you about setbacks in the months ahead that make it so you can't hit the targets you're talking about? Hmm. Well, we are a, sort of long-term industry and we need plans over many months, over years. And um, the pandemic <laughs> is not providing this visibility. Therefore, we have to um, prepare ourselves for more resilience than what we've seen in the past. It's very refreshing to see the situation in the US moving very quickly uh, in the right direction. There is a sentiment of optimism in the US that I like very much. Um, and it's true that the vaccination campaign has been very efficient, very fast, um, but it's also a, a good signal for the other countries, for the other regions of the world. Um, I mean, when the vaccination campaign uh, starts to reach a certain point, uh, then the uh, contamination goes down, economy uh, can reopen, activity can start again. So I'm hopeful that Europe, having started later, uh, with a lot of issues on the coordination among the countries, and I have my frustrations on, uh, on the, the situation in Europe, but I think uh, the US is showing the way, the vaccination campaign in Europe as well is making good progress now, and um, I am quite uh, optimistic, hopeful at least, that uh, Europe will follow US, probably with a couple of months of delay, 
but would it be later if we can be in the same situation for the summer um, and have a good summer, have reopening of uh, the majority of businesses? Uh, I think the pent up demand is very strong in Europe as well. And people are willing to start to live again. They are expecting more freedom than what they have today. They know uh, we need to put the um, uh, pandemic under a certain level of control. And they believe, and I believe, uh, the vaccination campaign is the way to get there. Because when we look at the US, that's the case. So uh, hopefully, we have US, Europe, other parts of the world following. Then we have reopening of the majority of businesses, including aviation. Uh, and that will be the start of the end, the beginning of the end. Um, so uh, I, I think you know, Guillaume, how devoted the Atlantic Council is to the transatlantic community, uh, the transatlantic economy, sort of the centerpiece for the uh, world economy. And we've long believed that this dispute between Airbus and Boeing uh, uh, hurts uh, uh, everyone uh, in a way in the global competition. But what was encouraging was that the US and EU entered a four month suspension of tariffs related to the Airbus Boeing dispute and the US trade chief recently proposed a six month uh, tariff freeze. But these are still short term measures. And I'm just wondering what you see as the prospect for a longer term solution to this issue and, and how important do you find uh, this whole matter for the economy in general? Thank you for the question, uh, Fred. I think uh, uh, aviation is, a, is mainly a North Atlantic ecosystem. Um, we are both by from the US a lot. Um, the US companies and Boeing buy from Europe. We sell to Europe, to the rest of the world, to the US and vice versa. Uh, aviation is a small business. I mean, before the pandemic, we were delivering uh, all together, Boeing and us and all the suppliers contributing to it around uh, up to uh, 1,500 planes a year. So that, that's very small, actually, uh, in terms of numbers. And of course, last year, we delivered uh, hardly half of these numbers. So it's a small ecosystem, and it's a North Atlantic ecosystem. And putting uh, trade barriers, putting tariffs in the middle of the Atlantic in my view, and I've been quite transparent on that topic from the beginning, is not making sense. Um, I think uh, with escalation of the tariffs and uh, the decisions of the WTO, we are now in a situation where it's really obvious that this is a lose-lose situation for everyone. And we are much better off finding a resolution to the dispute. So I'm happy to see that on both sides, there is a, what I believe, what I perceive as a real intention uh, to find a resolution. Uh, there are some subsidies, um, and there have been subsidies in the past on uh, aviation, both sides of the Atlantic in different ways. Obviously, each side believes the other way is not the right one. So we need to come to a situation where it's uh, more or less acceptable for both parties and move forward. And the situation today is even more uh, unfortunate that we have COVID-19 and that, that we are in a very difficult situation. So um, I trust the uh, short-term situation you were mentioning before, the, the short-term ceasefire, uh, is the way to find a resolution and then go to a more long-term situation. And it will allow us to address other challenges, um, other uh, players, newcomers, uh, that come also with uh, uh, some strong support from their states. And I think it is the interest of both the EU and the US and Boeing and Airbus to find an agreement and to move forward. I don't want to press you too hard on this, but what are the prospects for that long-term solution? Uh, it's taken us a long time to get here. How long is it going to take us to get out of uh, this dispute? I believe it's just a matter of willingness. I don't see any uh, obstacle that cannot be resolved um, in the dispute. It was a, a long-term situation that developed over 15 years. Uh, no party was willing to accept uh, uh, the, um, the, the situation um, imposed by the other one. So, but having looked at the consequences of these uh, tariffs going up, I think everybody understands it's better to find an agreement. So there will be an agreement. There was an agreement, uh, by the way, 15 years ago. You remember there was a, a, 
a standstill agreement uh, between Boeing and Airbus that worked for more than a decade, I think. So there's, it's not something that cannot be resolved. And if the EU and the US have the willingness to sit down and look at the situation and agree on what can be acceptable and what is not, even if it has a different flavor of both sides, I think it's just a matter of willingness. So I'm very optimistic that now that we see uh, on both sides uh, a willingness to, to get to that deal, that we'll get it. And by the way, and thank you. going yeah. back to the previous situation with tariffs would really be meaningless for both Boeing and Airbus and all the other industries which are impacted. So that's another reason why I'm quite optimistic. Thank you so, so much for that, Guillaume. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about China. Um, Thierry Breton, the European commissioner, spoke about it. He spoke about clean networks and 5G. If I'm not mistaken, and you can correct me if this is wrong, you sell 25% or more of your planes in China, maybe during COVID-19 coming out, that could grow. How important is that market for Airbus? And how do you see it developing in the years ahead? Um, the uh, Chinese market, uh, be it for Airbus or Boeing, um, was sort of 20 to 25 percent of the global market um, in the past recent years. Uh, as far as I remember, uh, last year, 2020, for us, it was around 20 percent, maybe slightly less than 20 percent in terms of number of deliveries out of the 566 planes uh, we delivered last year. And we think China will remain a very important market uh, moving forward um, on the planet. Uh, as we have today, mainly two um, commercial airplane manufacturers that are competitive, uh, Boeing and Airbus, um, this uh, Chinese market is shared between the, the two players in different ways on the single aisle and the wide bodies. Uh, but I'm just um, trying to, to say Basically, uh, it, it's been an important market. It will remain an important market. They will progressively come uh, with a domestic product. Uh, you know that Comac is uh, developing the 919 that will be um, um, a single aisle product um, entering into the market probably next year or the year later. It will start slowly, probably reaching um, at the beginning only the Chinese airlines. But we believe this will progressively, be, progressively become um, uh, a decent player, so we will go probably from a duopoly to a triopoly, at least on the single aisle, by the end of the decade. And therefore, uh, Chinese markets, even with this new player, will continue to be, for Boeing, for Airbus, a very important market to address. So by the end of the decade, there's going to be Airbus, Boeing, and a Chinese rival. It will be a triopoly instead of a, a duopoly. In your view, that's not, that's not an unlikely scenario. It's still difficult to say at what speed and with what level of competitiveness uh, Comac will be able to um, to introduce the uh, 919 in the market. We believe they will start with China because the Chinese airlines are state-owned companies and it's easier to do it. It takes a lot of time to demonstrate the maturity of a product. Uh, to make it reliable, trusted, and, and economically viable. Uh, but we believe uh, it's not unlikely that on the single aisle, by the end of the decade, um, Comac will have taken a certain share of the market. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> you spoke earlier about supply chains and how they've held up in aviation. Uh, if you look at the auto industry, it's a nightmare right now. It was semiconductors and shortages of semiconductors. Um, could you compare what's happened in the aviation industry? Have you what issues have you had during COVID nineteen with global supply chains? How do you think they'll change going forward? We have looked very uh, seriously and uh, very deeply into the supply chain uh, during COVID nineteen, and we continue to do it. We've put in place with um, other uh, companies, other OEMs, what we call uh, watchtowers. Uh, with two main objectives. One is to get transparency and anticipation uh, on the evolution of the situation of the suppliers, not to be uh, in a situation that what you're describing with uh, semiconductors in the car industry. And we have as well equipped ourselves with, um, uh, I mean, with uh, funds or with tools to be able to intervene uh, with equity um, on the suppliers that would potentially be in a very difficult situation. What we've done as well on the Airbus side, uh, we have done our very best to provide a visibility on the um, 
levels of production that would be expected on our planes and try to be as stable as possible to give the opportunity for our suppliers uh, to plan, to execute, um, and, and to be able to be resilient uh, in that crisis. For the moment, it's been quite successful. I remain very prudent and humble because we see the situation is still evolving very quickly. We've seen with India, I think you referred to it, um, a big change, a, a drastic and fast change on the situation. So we, we remain quite prudent. And if I have to uh, give uh, an appreciation, um, um, a sentiment on the state of the supply chain today, I think um, we have not a situation similar to what you mentioned before. The majority, if not all suppliers, have found ways to weather the situation. Uh, there are some exceptions and we are dealing with them. But generally speaking, uh, the um, aviation supply chain has managed to survive the situation and not impact uh, the OEMs in a way that would um, uh, prevent us from delivering planes. So I remain humble because things can change very quickly. We've seen that what happened on the car industry was uh, not on the radar scope a couple of months before it happened. Uh, that's why we have the watchtowers and we are trying to anticipate as much as we can, gaining visibility. But again, prudently, I can tell you today, we don't see a similar situation in aviation, at least not for the moment. And I hope it will stay like this. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, my next question might have even been at the center of a conversation I would have had with you a few years ago. Uh, when Airbus was uh, competing for a, a Pentagon tanker contract. And we all remember back to the disappointment at that time for uh, Airbus. But what do you see as the outlook for transatlantic defense cooperation? It's, um, it's a cooperation in the sense that um, the, uh, the US and the European countries are together in NATO. Um, NATO is probably the strongest alliance uh, we've ever been in, and at least in the recent history. And it's very important that both uh, the European countries and the US continue to, to uh, contribute to NATO. Uh, when it comes to uh, defense, uh, European countries are buying US goods, US products. Uh, they've done it in the past, but Europe wants also to reinforce uh, its own defense industry. I think it was... Um, uh, very much supported by uh, the president uh, administration in the US that pushed Europe to take probably more care of its own sovereignty. And we believe uh, at Airbus that it was a good move for Europe. Uh, we think it will continue, but with probably uh, a more longer perspective, um, a, a US that is seen from Europe as more cooperative with this um, Biden administration than it was the case uh, with uh, uh, the previous one. And at the end of the day, um, the situation is such that we are uh, competing and cooperating. And that's the very nature of the uh, transatlantic relationship is that we have competitors both sides. Uh, it's a tough competition. I think it's very healthy as long as we have a, a level playing field and that it's an amicable competition. And when it comes to defense, as we are together in NATO, yes, there is a tough competition. Uh, we want the rules of the games to be fair, both sides. And, what we really didn't like in the case you, uh, you, you reminded us just before is we had the feeling it was not completely a fair competition. Um, but when it's a fair competition, it's healthy and it's okay. And it's helping both sides to develop more competitive products. Now having deep cooperation uh, between OEMs, uh, between companies, both sides of the Atlantic is not that easy. So uh, we buy from each other, uh, we buy components, uh, but large corporations are more frequent in Europe between European countries than across the Atlantic uh, for the reasons I tried to mention before. Um, so uh, just looking to the clock and knowing we don't have that much time left, uh, I won't drill down so much on that issue, but we, we certainly the Atlantic Council hope for deeper transatlantic defense cooperation. Uh, and so looking for ways to achieve that will be in our interest. Um, but I'd like to turn to green technologies. It's one of the uh, one of the areas where I've been watching Airbus closest. And you recently made a big announcement about the role hydrogen uh, could play. Uh, you, I think you spoke of full hydrogen planes by 2035. 
And that was way ahead of where I think the thinking has been on this side of the Atlantic uh, and also within Boeing. Uh, tell us where, why, why you're so confident of that and where things are going in terms of uh, green technology and, and, uh, and aerospace. Mm. Um, we've always been very focused on um, environments, uh, but even more recently than in, in the past because of the trend becoming bigger and bigger and uh, probably also the, the, the feeling of urgency uh, with the climate change and the global warming uh, being stronger every day. Uh, there are short-term, mid-term, and long-term measures when it comes to bringing the solutions to the market. On the short term, the best way to reduce the um, emissions is to replace old planes that have a much higher, much bigger fuel burn by modern ones, uh, which are by far more efficient and therefore release uh, less CO2 per passenger and per kilometer. Then on the short term, mid term, we have the opportunity to work with uh, sustainable aviation fuels. And uh, together with the airlines, I think together with Boeing, by the way, on that front, we believe the SAFs are the avenue for the next years. The planes we are delivering are today already capable and, and, and of- for, and, and for an audience that doesn't know what a SAF is, could you translate SAF for us? Sustainable aviation fuel. Okay, these okay, are biofuels or fuels which have yeah. a very low carbon content. Thank you, uh, Fred, to remind I'm sorry me. to have interrupted. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, thank you for that. Um, um, but the, the sustainable aviation fuels are a very good short term, mid term solution. But we believe on the long term, we have to find ways of not emitting um, any carbon in the atmosphere. A, a solution that is net zero is not enough. And to go to that point, uh, we come to the conclusion that hydrogen. Uh, is one of the solutions, if not the solution. On top, we see a very strong momentum for hydrogen for many other industries as a way to store intermittent energies like solar, like wind energy, and this will be required. So we see a convergence. Uh, we are using hydrogen um, on our rockets, uh, on our satellites. This is liquid hydrogen. Uh, I was in the car industry a decade ago, and we see the car industry, the truck industry, going to hydrogen. And, and we think that's really a strong opportunity. That's why we've put the um, hydrogen plane very high on our agenda. It's not the only answer, uh, and it's more a long-term answer. We are fully uh, cognizant of that. But we think that's a fantastic opportunity for the long-term to have aviation, not only uh, being the only mode of transport to, to not um, impose anything um, uh, on the ground, you don't need an infrastructure on the ground. You don't need to damage the ecosystems on the ground. You fly in the air, but on top, not releasing uh, carbon in the air. There are engineering challenges. There are technological challenges, that's for sure. But we don't believe, um, or we believe they will be overcome. And we see the time frame to 2035, a very credible one. So we think on the plane side, it will be OK. We will need as well large quantities of decarbonized fuels them uh, e-fuels or hydrogen. The e-fuels are one sort of sustainable aviation fuels, artificial ones. Um, and we will need a regulation. We will need a global framework for aviation. Um, in that sense, we very much welcome uh, the momentum uh, given by uh, Joe Biden and the administration to be back to the Paris Agreement and to uh, put the bar very high. So if we have US, Europe, and potentially China, joining to create this level playing field for carbon in aviation, then we will have the, the means to invest on technologies to bring decarbonized planes and to contribute to aviation for the future um, in a climate neutral way. So that's why we are very uh, adamant uh, to see hydrogen on planes. And, and just very briefly to close, is there a chance for Airbus to engage in transatlantic cooperation with, as you said, the Biden administration being so for this. So not just countries around the world, but your company in transatlantic cooperation on green technology across the Atlantic. Yes, yes, of course. Um, and um, we are not always well understood as Airbus. Sometimes from the US, we are seen as a, um, a European uh, Boeing. That's not what we are. Uh, we are a, a more global company. We have assembly lines, activities, uh, in the US big time. We buy a lot in the US, we sell in the US. So we are a very strong player in the US and we are already cooperating with the um, US industry uh, big time. So um, for this um, 
fantastic challenge that is the, the decarbonization of aviation, the, the, the climate agenda. Uh, we look forward to more cooperation with the US partners, with the US administration, why not? Uh, we want to be understood for, for what we are, a very strong player in the US, for the US, uh, with employment uh, in the country, um, in the satellite business, in helicopters, and of course, um, on the uh, commercial airplane, we have assembly lines for the 320 family, for the A220 in the US, um, and that's what we are. So we are already cooperating, and we are very much willing to cooperate even more in the future. Guillaume, it has been a delight to fly through this half hour with you with such a fascinating conversation. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time for the EU US Future Forum. And I hope the next time we'll see each other in person. My great pleasure, Fred. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, so uh, I invite everyone to continue following along with the US, uh, EU, EU, US Future Forum Interchangeable and the great programming that's yet to come. Uh, today, we have conversations on China with Senator James Risch and a, a discussion on local resilience with mayors of cities from both sides of the Atlantic. Also, stay tuned for uh, the interview with the German Greens Party co-leader, Annalena Baerbach, with my friend Farid Zakaria of, uh, uh, of CNN today at 11.10 Eastern time. This will be her first US interview since officially becoming the Green Party's chancellor. I think there's a high degree of interest to see what she's going to say. Uh, and of course, the federal elections are this September, so not so far off. Uh, we also will hear from a, a, a joint conversation, and, and this one I think everyone should tune into as well, between the U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm uh, and the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. I think they'll touch on the sorts of issues that Guillaume Faurie just shared with us as well, uh, the uh, almost revolutionary uh, opportunity that hydrogen could, could, uh, could provide for uh, air travel. These uh, will all be can't miss sessions, so stay tuned. Uh, it was great to have you and Fari with us, and now I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, uh, to to Katarina Soku, a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council, who's going to pick up on the issues of transatlantic trade uh, in a post-COVID-19 environment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fred, and hello from Athens, Greece, where I'm currently located. The transatlantic trade relationship has taken some significant hits over the past few years. Tariff battles, old and new, COVID-related challenges, the political fights over trade policy that has, have certainly dominated the news. How big is really the damage to the trade relationship, which is vitally important for both the EU and the US economy? And as we set ambitious targets and an agendas for recovery on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, how, where can we count on more policy coordination? What are the challenges that need to be addressed as a matter of priority? To answer these questions, we're delighted to have with us I mean, Susan Tanger, CEO of AMCHAM EU and Chair of the European AMCHAMS, speaking for American businesses, of course, that are invested in Europe. Ambassador Ronald Gidwitz, a businessman and diplomat who served as United States Ambassador to Belgium and Acting Ambassador to the EU under the Trump administration. And Rupert Schlegelmilch, Director of Trade at the European Commission, working, of course, on the EU-US trade ties. To kick off the conversation, I would like to invite Susan to, to to discuss uh, how do we reset the transatlantic trade relationship as part of the global economic recovery after all these significant uh, tariff battles of the past few years. Susan? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, well, that's a big question. So may maybe just to put it in perspective, first of all, I mean, I think you're very right to, to mention, first of all, global economic recovery. It's called the great lockdown, I think, just to throw one statistic out there, first of all, is that the, the EU's GDP has dropped by a staggering 38% in recent times, uh, and the global economy is contracted by 4%, and the US, uh, the US economy, the Euro economy more by 7%. So I think absolutely, I think also, you know, how, how we reset the relationship to help with that recovery First of all, yes, why is the reset needed? Well, the reset is indeed needed because of all these headwinds that we've seen over the last, um, the last four years, certainly, 
escalating trade tensions and tariffs. We've had expanding restrictions on foreign investment, uh, disputes over the future of NATO, the approach to WTO. I know we're going to go into those a little bit more, Katerina. So to answer your question, in short, how do we do this? Well, we need cooperation. We've got to build back bridges. We definitely need cooperation, whether it's on regulatory cooperation to advance trade, whether it's un um, cooperation with regard to tackling unfair market practices and anti-competitive behavior. We need cooperation on reforming multilateral institutions. Um, we need to foster cooperation as well on transatlantic defense. Uh, and, may and maybe finally, on supply chain resilience and export controls, we definitely can cooperate there. Um, you know, I'm happy to expand a bit more, Katerina, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may turn to Ambassador Kitwitz, you were ambassador to the EU during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, and uh, we did experience significant disruptions as well to, 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 to trade. Are you concerned about the future of trade and how permanent these disruptions yeah. might be even after COVID to transatlantic trade? I, I think there's a variety of, of concerns that I have with respect to uh, the uh, Putting, putting the genie back in the bottle. I think it's going to be very difficult. Clearly, when we look at the way that the COVID pandemic has been financed, we're going to see countries across the world, and particularly in Europe, here, as well as here in the United States, with enormous deficits that had not been anticipated. And so how those deficits are dealt with will have a, a major bearing on uh, our way forward. Uh, as well, uh, the trade deficit that the United States has suffered over the course of the last several years is not is, is bound to get worse as opposed to get better, which I will I believe will create some real friction between ourselves and the European Union. Uh, the trade deficit essentially is net net uh, $130 billion negative to the US, but uh, it's part of that deficit is offset by uh, a uh, services a services surplus, so the real goods deficit is $180 billion, but the service the service sector is under attack. The Schrems 2 decision, for example, last July, a year ago, uh, underscores the kind of uh, fragility that exists uh, with respect to, to the, the services area. Uh, Privacy Shield, which was a vehicle set up in 2015 to allow for uh, allow for transatlantic data flows, rep and it represents about $50 billion of uh, transatlantic trade, has been ruled illegal. And so how we deal with some of these very difficult issues and the political outfall of that <coughs> is really going to be important. Thank you. And uh, Robert, if I may turn to you, there's no denying the tensions of the past few years, but, but we do have a new administration in the U.S. And uh, how do you see the Biden-Harris administration after it reached its 100-day uh, milestone? How do you assess the course that has been started for EU-U.S. relations so far? Yes, thank you. And also a thanks from my side for being able to join this interesting conversation. And I have to say, uh, we're very encouraged to put it in, in one sentence by the start of the Biden-Harris administration. In particular, we, we are noticing that the, uh, the, the point which is made that working with allies is needed in the world trading scenario. Working with allies in a constructive way is actually also followed by some uh, initial actions. We have been able to uh, suspend the tariffs on Airbus and Boeing, the, the aircraft dispute, and we have also seen some moves elsewhere to lower the temperature, if I may say so. There are still things out there that were already mentioned. But I think it's very important that we also both are taking a hard look at the trade policy that we're having, the build back backer on the one hand, and the, EU, the new EU trade policy uh, that we have came out under the, the title of open, sustainable, and assertive. And I think now the challenge is really to go a little bit deeper and build a positive agenda which we hadn't had, I have to be honest, in the last couple of years, and see what is actually the challenge that we have to face beyond the legacy issues on disputes. And these are issues like the green transition, and this is where the, the change in the climate policy in the US will be very important, and the digital transition, which are the two main, if you take a long-term view, uh, challenges we face. And for both, trade plays a role that I'm happy to go on deeper in the conversation. But trade must be an enabler for a greener uh, policy and for a more digitally enabled policy. 
And that includes also getting out of the crisis together. Not only do we have a question maybe of financial viability or, fi or fiscal viability, we also have to make sure that all these distorting, if you wish, uh, ultimately all the subsidies we're giving out now for good reasons, uh, will not become permanent and distort the global marketplace on the long term. And that will be a challenge because everywhere we have now been looking uh, away about the question of what do these subsidies actually do to the global marketplace, uh, which normally we discipline through WTO and other rules. So the, 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 the positive agenda is there, we now have to make it work. Thank you, and you're leading us into the next uh, the next round of questions on exactly the convergences that are in trade policies that can serve as a springboard for greater cooperation. And Susan, if I may turn to you, you've argued exactly that the, this twin transition towards a sustainable and digital economy opens up new fronts for close cooperation. Uh, what do we need to do in the transatlantic community to save the global standards for the digital economy uh, and uh, the green standards for uh, in accordance with uh, uh, the transatlantic values and priorities. Yes, thank you, Katerina. Yeah, maybe let me touch on um, a couple of various concrete ideas from the business community on where we can really cooperate. So what we have to do. Um, so absolutely to, to what uh, Rupert said, that we totally support green transition and digital, digital transition with regard to economic recovery. Yeah, and a couple of ideas to put out there will be artificial intelligence. That's one area to cooperate. They're important on both sides. We're not very far away. Uh, we could really work together on create on having a human centric approach to to solving this big issue. So there's sort of one concrete idea. Um, another one will be, you know, giving the concrete ideas first clinical research. Uh, let's have some mut mutual recognition agreement on the on inspections on both sides. There's so much duplication that goes on at the moment. Uh, we could share resources. Absolutely. So what we need is good clinical practice inspections to be coordinated. Another one is actually on clean technology. So in the, in the area of sustainability, Katerina, absolutely. You know, the, the speed of development that there is, we need this technology, not technological advancement. But if we remove regulatory hurdles for business, we can move even faster. So if we can open dialogue between the EU and the US, this area to remove some of these burdens, this would really help. Uh, and then another area would be data transfers. Um, I believe you know one of my, my co-panelists here, perhaps both already mentioned the privacy shields as being one of the barriers. And um, we've got to ensure the ability to transfer personal data between the US and the EU. This is a real sticking point. It is absolutely essential, particularly for SMEs actually, rather than big companies. So we do need to come up with an alternative mechanism. I mean, it's been encouraging that Secretary Raimondo and Didier Reinders recently signed um, an agreement on that. So those are some concrete areas, if I may, just briefly. Yeah, there's a lot of already convergence areas already. The US has got its trade agenda. The EU has its. Obviously, Mr. Schlegel is a far more expert than I am on that. But even if you look at what, what the, the areas uh, of convergence are in there, perhaps one, one last area would be multilateralism, which we haven't, um, I think, mentioned there. I think, believe both trade agendas, there is an area of convergence that we could work on, which is reforming uh, WTO. There, you know, big areas there. We need the WTO. Um, <clears throat> if we want to move forward, this is a, a huge area of convergence in both trade policies and an area of cooperation. So I'd support that. Thank you. And Ambassador, same question to you. What do you think are the convergence opportunities in trade policy in, transatlantic, in the transatlantic agenda going forward? Well, I, let me begin by saying I agree with Susan with respect to the WTO. I think it's terribly important that we get a uh, real resolution to a way forward so that we have a viable and workable uh, multilateral agreement on how we're going to deal with trade issues. If we don't do that, I think that there, that will cast a shadow over uh, so many other so many other issues. So that would be number one. Number two, I think there's a short term opportunity in energy. I recognize that uh, long term uh, we, we want to move to and this administration, the U.S. administration is very set upon moving to, to green. But at the same time, they're talking about uh, uh, issues such as the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we, the United States, would like to be a would like to substitute for the gas that's being sold by Russia. There's a, there's a dual reason for doing that. First of all, it improves our balance of trade uh, and it doesn't, shouldn't damage the European balance of trade as a result, since they're importing the 
and we'll be importing more of the Russian uh, gas. But the other issue is why are we financing Russia's buildup of uh, their military weapons? And so I think there's a there's a, a twofer there, if you will, with respect to the short term energy needs. And then uh, lastly, uh, I think we, I, I, I think there's it's, it's critically important that we find a way to deal with some of these these privacy issues uh, right now. Uh, the the loss of, of uh, privacy shield, the question about standard contractual clauses, which is for the bigger co corporations, which while haven't been attacked as as well uh, by the European Court of Justice, still are under review and question. So uh, data and information is critical to all of our futures, and we need to find a way to resolve that sooner rather than later. Thank you. And Rupert, if I may turn to you, uh, and same question, but uh, I would also would like to bring into uh, the agenda. The, the EU has proposed the EU-US Trade and Tech Council, and it seems that the US is warming up to the idea of structuring an effective dialogue on trade and tech issues to resolve these disputes. Uh, what are the EU priorities in this regard? And please feel free to respond to the previous points raised. Yes, thank you, thank you. I think uh, I would like to first say that uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged also by the support for the multilateral trading system, which is in bad shape. Uh, both uh, have, um, <coughs> Susan and the ambassador have actually said that this is important and we wholeheartedly agree because these are the rules we need for a predictable trading environment worldwide. And I'm not only talking about uh, maybe China, which uh, you know, ex exploits some of the loopholes in these rules where we need new ones, but also the rest of the world, they take their cue from, from stability and a worldwide system to trade. On the more granular issues on what to do next, in particular on trade and technology, it's exactly the reason that we all have been uh, agreeing that the digital tra trade is becoming the most, uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, we have to get an idea on how to regulate the digital space, because if, if, if we fragment it further, then I think the, the, the positive elements, effects of having an economy of scales and using uh, the internet basically for trade will just diminish. And we have major differences when it comes to some of these technologies, how to deal with them, what technology also to make available to those who don't share our values. Uh, and that starts with not so much with data privacy, because there I think we have the same values, we just have different ways to implement it. But the real difference is with some of the other less democratic societies, if you wish. Uh, and then we have the, who use some of the uh, other technologies and AI was mentioned to supervision uh, their own uh, the way, population in a way that we would think is not democratic. So making sure that we get the best out of the internet and the digital transition, and at the same time, don't hinder the trade where we don't need to is a very delicate discussion because we see that the instruments that we are using, not only in the, in the US, we also have export controls. We denied a lot of exports to China in the last year, by the way, in some of the critical technologies. But we have to have a common vision what we should, how we should address this so we don't get into each other's hairs on these issues. Uh, that's, I think, a very important point. But it's, it's more than that. The Trade and Tech Council should also look at the very important question of standards. Again, you, we have to set standards for many of these technologies. AI has been mentioned. Artificial intelligence is one of the key ones. But there is also automotive driving, robotics, uh, quantum, and so on. And we are much more effective transatlantically to the benefit of our business if we have a shared approach to these issues and not fragmented these markets of the future. Thank you. And I love it how you all went straight to the sticking points as well, which is the next round of questions that I have for you. So how do we build this consensus on the sticking points in the trade relationship? And I would like to turn to Susan. You've singled out the tariffs part of her steel, but also welcome the temporary suspension of the aircraft tariffs, right? Uh, the dispute at the World, World Trade Organization. Um, as two of the trade irritants, uh, old and new, are you confident that the new the two sides may reach an agreement to add uh, these disputes? Uh, that's a tricky question. I mean, I think it's, we are optimistic. I think the, uh, the actual temporary suspension, as you just said yourself, is a very positive sign that the two sides now who, who are here together are ready to move towards constructively to long term solutions. So I, I believe there is a will there. I think there's more optimism in the air 
certainly uh, in 2021 that we can move towards something I think both sides want to find a solution. However, we're a bit a little bit concerned about the, the time span here because four months is not long. So we've, we're really hoping for um, some speedy negotiations here. So, so what we can bury this hatchet permanently and just move on um, and stop this tit for tat. Um, you know, if we can move on and pave the way for more global rules for aeroplane manufacturing, it would be much better generally. On steel and aluminium, I think that's a really important one. I mean, we're concerned at the moment about the other deadline looming, which is June 1st, which is not very far away, where in the, the counter tariffs imposed by the EU are set to double if the steel and aluminium tariffs imposed by the US have not been uh, removed. So um, no one be want, nobody wants that to happen. It has knock on effects on a whole range of what of industries and with have nothing to do with steel and aluminium. So very concerned about that. What we really what we really want to see, I mean, it's a, a great opportunity to look at the overarching issue. The wider issue is global, global overcapacity in steel and aluminium. And that's the issue on which the two sides should be working together. So you asked also earlier about areas for cooperation. That's exactly where we should be working together. Um, I mean, we've been actively speaking out since 2018 now for an exemption uh, for the EU and have proposed this national security argument. So we really advocate uh, working further on that. Uh, um, so th that's my answer to that, uh, that question. And just the, the last sticking point, I think, is the one that has just been mentioned by my co-panelists, which is data transfers again. If I had a third one to mention, so let's solve Airbus Boeing, solve steel and aluminium, and let's get data transfer sorted out and then we'd, we'd be up and away. So there we go. Thank you. And Ambassador, if I may turn to you, you've also been a business person. Are you concerned about uh, lasting protectionist pr pressures uh, in our societies after, after uh, this pandemic and how this may affect uh, transatlantic trade? What can we do to, uh, to resolve this? especially in the context of recovery and our own programs in its continent. I, I think it's terribly important that we find some, some quick successes. I mean, we have a lot of areas where we have some disagreement. Some of, many of these are incredibly intractable. Uh, Airbus, Boeing, for example, I think is an easy solution. We gotta get that problem solved. Yeah. On the other hand, the complexity, for example, of dealing with agricultural uh, subsidies and uh, non-tariff barriers it, it, it is a, an enormous political problem on both sides of the Atlantic. It, it, it is far better, far bigger politically than it is from a commercial standpoint, but it tends to, to, to spoil the environment if we don't have some successes in that area. Uh, we also have some places where I think everybody could move and work together. Uh, we've had an enormously difficult time with the pandemic we ought to be thinking about how do we, what do we do about the next pandemic and where can we work together to prepare and have, be sure that we have a sufficiency of vaccines, sufficiently of P, a sufficiency of PPE, what kinds of reserves should we be putting together? How should we be thinking about uh, manufacturing processes for these kinds of critical elements across the world and particularly both in Europe and in the United States? These are the kinds of things that I think have a political currency and our most people would agree there's an opportunity another area that i think we ought to be working very closely together with with uh europe again that's a win-win and not terribly controversial is in the question of rare earths uh, the chinese have basically monopolized on a very strategic basis the, uh, the ingredients for a lot of the information pro uh, processing uh, equipment uh, the, the chips and what have you and so I think we need to look very carefully at uh, uh, what our needs are and work with the European Union to ensure that there's an adequacy of supply outside of a dependency on China. Thank you. And uh, Rupert, over to you. Can we build a consensus on trade issues of particular concern to the US like uh, uh, over dependence on China or uh, Chinese technology or Russian gas? Uh, what's the EU response there? Thank you. Yes, I think we can do much better in that respect. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, the ambassador just mentioned the whole question of supply chain resilience, which the uh, crisis had put the spotlight on, but which was there before dependencies existed before, and they, uh, they're actually quite limited when you look at the health sector. Um, we've reached out to the new administration because there is a major so, an executive order being implemented now on supply chain resilience. 
A similar exercise is going on on the EU side where we are with the DG Grow colleagues have done a major study on dependencies in Europe. We need to compare these results and look at what is really needed by way of intervention. There will be interventions, but I think they should be well-founded and they should be hopefully aligned with what we see as common threats to dependency or risks, risk assessment. I think there is scope for that. There is scope for uh, working on the conflicts as uh, Susan has mentioned. And that has also a, a big, a big um, aspect of uh, supply chains and market distortions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the aircraft market. It's not so much the old fight we had at the WTO, which we've litigated to the end, and we all have our sanctions rights. Now the question is, what kind of aircraft market do you want to have in the future? And just before this event, we heard about hydrogen planes and so on, which will need massive subsidies, and it will not be only the US and the EU who will deal with that. You will have new engines in the market. So we have to put the focus to the future to get through these events, through these uh, uh, disputes. And of course, on steel and aluminium, everything has been said. We are not a security threat. We have to find a way to deal with the overcapacity. That's the key. Thank you so much. And I'm afraid we're running out of time. So uh, we I don't think there's any disagreement among ourselves that uh, we need across the board cooperation between the US and the EU to uh, if we are to give ourselves uh, a chance of completing this uh, uh, of recovering our economies out of the pandemic and uh, transforming our agenda, the, the economy in both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I, I would like to thank you all very much for your participation. I look forward, looking forward to more and heading back to the studio with uh, Maggie and Travis. Thank you, Katerina. Fascinating conversation all around, each exploring a different angle of shared values and strategic financial approaches between the EU and the US. Yes, between exploring the world's largest trade relationship, the role businesses play in fostering economic stability and success, and brainstorming how best to emerge successfully from this pandemic, one theme can emerge clearly. This is a mutually beneficial relationship. Neither the EU nor the US can fully grow out of this pandemic without collaboration in these areas. Simply put, they depend on each other to help each other rise out of times of strife. Absolutely, Travis. That doesn't mean that everything is agreed upon. As you heard, there have been and will always be disagreements. But the major fact remains that when we take a step back, the EU and the US share the world's largest trade relationship and have always leaned on each other to facilitate economic success. This central theme is no more imperative to understand than in times like these. And there are many other areas where collaboration remains of supreme interest, too. Up next, we are going to hear a dialogue about China. Before proceeding forward, however, we want to let you know that there has been a slight shift in the programming. After this conversation on China, we will touch on transatlantic security and defense before exploring how cities on both sides of the Atlantic are working to rebuild from the pandemic. First, we have the pleasure of welcoming Stuart Lau, EU-China correspondent for Politico, who sits down with Laura Rosenberger, the Senior Director for China at the National Security Council, Dr. Antoine Bondas, Research Fellow and Director of the Taiwan Program at the Foundation R. La Recherche Stratégique, and His Excellency Sandy Karib, the Mayor of Prague. Thank you very much. And Distinguished panel here from Washington, D.C., from Paris, and from Prague. We'll go straight to the White House since we have a special guest here with us, Laura. What is, um, what is happening in the U.S. now? And Brussels in just a few months ago, this G7 summit uh, with a lot of you know mention about China with the European counterpart. So, what is the White House going to do vis-a-vis -vis cooperating with Europe on China? Hi, Stuart. It's so great to be with you and with colleagues on this panel. I apologize. I was having a little bit of a hard time hearing your audio there. I don't know if others were having the same problem, but I did catch the tail end of your question there about our priorities in terms of working with Europe on China. So I will um, I will just pick up the ball and hope that I didn't miss too much there in, in transmission. 
Um, but really great to be with all of you. And this is just such an important conversation for all of us to be having. I think um, you know, the, the priority that the United States is placing um, on working with Europe on a wide range of issues um, if that you know, are the foundation of our shared interests, peace, prosperity, and values together um, has been on full display across the 100 plus um, first days of the Biden administration. Um, that's been very clear, of course, in particular in the area of China. We've seen uh, Secretary Blinken in Europe several times, including just this week, um, some uh, really important um, statements coming out of his meetings with G7 counterparts, um, with others during his visit, I think are a real testament to the degree to which the United States and Europe share a number of concerns um, about China's behavior, whether that's its course of trade practices, whether that's its human rights abuses, um, whether that is some of the security challenges that we're facing in terms of cybersecurity, critical infrastructure in the technology space. But I think it's really imperative for the United States and Europe to work together both to determine where our areas of um, shared interest are greatest and how we can maximize those. And as I heard a little bit at the tail end of the other panel, of course, we recognize that we're gonna have some differences. Um, as Secretary Blinken has made clear, this is not about the United States asking any of our allies to choose between the United States and China. But we do think that we need to figure out the best shared approaches that we can have together. I think the impact of some of that um, you know, cooperative work was, was quite clear um, in the coordinated actions that the United States, Europe, the UK, um, Canada took to impose sanctions on um, Chinese officials and entities for gross human rights abuses in Xinjiang. And the, um, you know, what I would characterize as an overreaction that we saw from Beijing in terms of its retaliatory response that um, took aim not just at government officials, but at academics, researchers, really impinging on academic freedom um, and, and freedom of the press in some significant ways. And so I think that um, you know, we saw there Beijing's strong reaction was actually, I think, mostly about the fact that it was surprised with that robust coordination between the United States and key European allies. I think that there's a lot of work for us to continue to build on there. Um, again, I, I know that we will, um, you know, in certain areas have differences, but we as allies have always um, worked through those things together. Um, and I think, you know, when we, when we look at some of President Biden's most important imperatives, he talked about this in his joint address, showing that democracy delivers. For him, this is very much about that. That is the defining challenge as he has laid it out. And the United States and Europe have done so much over the decades together to ensure robust democracy, not just in our own countries, but around the world. And I think that this is really a calling for us in this moment against the backdrop of COVID, against the backdrop um, of the economic challenges that we face to really um, you know, reinvest in our democracies and in democratic values um, in the international um, system. So that was a long wind up there, um, but wanted to just kind of put a few things on the table at the top. Thank you. And after four years of um, the Trump administration, of course, there's a lot of concern about, you know, how sincere the U.S. offer this time is. There's a lot of talk about strategic autonomy. And um, what I've been hear hearing here in Brussels is that, you know, the U.S. really does need to convince Europe on, for example, the unilateral actions that the U.S. has been doing, has been taking, uh, open RAN, export control, steel tariffs. How are you going to convince your European partners that you know, what you're doing on China, what you're asking Europe to do on China is not just about US self-interest? Well, I think it's a great question. And I think it's partly again about sort of going back to basics and reminding ourselves about um, what's at stake in this competition, right? Um, there are, um, you know, our, our alliance across the Atlantic is founded on shared values. And um, even where we have some of the differences that you laid out, and even when there's been unilateral actions by the Trump administration, um, I think that when we look at those shared values that so underpin everything we have done together, and then we map on top of that our other shared interests with one another, um, I think that it's quite clear that the United States and Europe have a significant interest in working together. But your question points to an important piece um, of this conversation which is that I think sometimes when we talk about the US and Europe cooperating on China, 
um, that somehow gets framed in terms of simply an effort to counter China or to contain, to contain China. And you heard from Secretary Blinken, I think, over, over the weekend in some of his comments in his 60 Minutes interview, you know, that that's really um, you know, not what the United States is looking to do. I think, again, this comes back to showing that democracies deliver. Um, I really love and think this is such an important point from the president, that this is about the US and Europe showing what we can do together, showing our affirmative approach to what an international rules-based system looks like for the 21st century one that actually delivers for its people, one that continues to ensure peace, prosperity, stability, security around the world. I think that's on us. And I think, you know, the United States certainly needs to show up and be able to demonstrate that we are partners in this. That's why, you know, we very early on rejoined a number of international institutions, whether um, the Paris, um, uh, you know, climate agreement, whether um, the World Health Organization, right, the, the Human Rights Council, uh, re-engaging on all those fronts is an important demonstration of that. But it also is, you know, a big part of our China strategy is about investing at home, investing in our own sources of strength, and making sure that we show the United States is, is still able to deliver on our own promises for ourselves. And I think that is also partly about demonstrating to our allies um, that, you know, our, our commitment is real. Thank you. We'll be going back to Washington in just a moment, but for the time being, maybe we can take a look at the picture in uh, the Czech Republic. So Mayor Hrib, um, there's been uh, a lot of spotlight on the Czech Republic's relations with China over the last year. Um, there was a parliamentary visit to Taiwan, um, and of course you were one of the members joining the trip. And, um, and then there were some sort of economic punitive measures imposed by Beijing. Um, could you tell us more about that experience and how you think about China's economic um, influence in Europe and how that is in how that is in turn influencing a lot of European politicians' decision making? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this session. Uh, well, uh, I have to um, say first of all. I'm speaking as a mayor of Prague, so uh, I have to focus on the role of the cities and the regional leaders in relation to China. However, uh, if we look at our experience, and I believe that although there are always some certain particular geo-cultural context, there is definitely a thing to share. There are definitely some general principles which could be applicable in other EU and US cities. And our experience is definitely that the China influence is a bit overrated or overestimated. Well, in case of Czech Republic, for example, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of strong words from the uh, from the side of China. However, in the end, uh, related to the visit of uh, Milos Vyskočil, the vice president. Uh, sorry, the president of, uh, of the Senate, uh, Czech Senate, and uh, there was a lot of strong words. However, in the end, if you look at the result, uh, the result is that uh, the China cancelled an order of 11 pianos from Czech Republic. And those pianos were quickly bought by, uh, uh, by a sponsor, a cultural sponsor, and uh, he gave them to the schools. So I don't really think that uh, this was a great damage for Czech Republic. Uh, maybe it was a bigger damage for China because they cannot uh, enjoy the experience of Czech pianos. However, uh, the really the economical impact was seriously not, not, uh, not strong. So there is really no reason to be servile to China and allow them to unilaterally dictate the rules. And I have to say, we definitely should have a new paradigm in approach towards China which will be centered around fair partnership, human rights, and mutual adhering to the rules. And just uh, give us a sense about, you know, being in Central Europe, and of course, on the one hand, you are a NATO member, but on the other hand, you also have platforms like the 17 plus one, where China is using to engage 
uh, with Central and Eastern European countries. Um, so you have strategic concerns on one hand, but also economic benefits on the other. Is it going to be more and more difficult for um, Central Europe to to plan their strategic decisions in the future, given this US-China um, dynamics? Well, uh, I seriously do not believe that we have any economical benefits from the 17 plus one or whatever initiatives with China. And uh, what we do have to understand is that China is not a reliable business partner, specifically not in cases like the, the COVID crisis or uh, any other. Because definitely, if you look at our experience, what they have done, uh, as we just tried to renegotiate the partnership contract between Prague and Beijing, and they started to bully our orchestras, canceling the already arranged tours, uh, uh, refusing to uh, fulfill the already signed contracts and so on. I think you have to see that there is a certain unreliability on their side and the second thing is they take everything very, very politically. And that is really seriously not good. So uh, I think we have to start to be less afraid about uh, what will China say to our actions. And that's the first thing, that's the first thing we have to agree on. Well, thank you very much. And now we move to and uh, have a few words with our third guest, Dr. Antoine Bondas. And Dr. Bondas, give us a sense about how China thinks about Europe these days. I mean, of course, they're facing stiff competition with the US on the one hand, and they have the comprehensive agreement of investment with Europe on the other, but then the prospect of the deal is also not looking very certain to say the least. Yeah, th thank you, and I I'm very glad to be with you all uh, uh, today. Um, I, I would say first that Beijing uh, has made a major mistake over the last few years in overestimating its capacity to influence some European countries and has also overestimated the dependence on some countries, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, on China. And we all agree that there cannot be prosperity without security, and many European countries rightly consider as member of NATO or else that the United States security commitment to Europe remain the main guarantee and the main security guarantee we have. Yet Beijing still see uh, Europe as a soft underbelly, if I may, of the West. And in this respect, welcome the emphasis that we've been doing on strategic autonomy, considering it actually as a mean to neutralize Europe and weaken the transatlantic tie. But let us be very clear. Uh, we have differences with the United States. Uh, we are in competition in many economic areas and we have even sometimes adopted by the defense of certain values by some US presidents. Yet strengthening our strategic autonomy does not mean of course being equidistant or remaining neutral between uh, Washington and Beijing, Europeans will always be closer to a perfectible democracy, what we always uh, are, uh, than a perfect um, autocracy. And that event today is even a, sim a, a symbol uh, of that. I would add also that on many issues, the European Union might look as a very strange machine with very complex mechanisms, sometimes difficult to understand. But there is one thing that is uh, very clear, that when the member states start moving, when they are aware of their common interests and the need to defend them all together, then you create a dynamic that is very hard to stop. And we've seen it on China. Uh, the joint strategy in 2019 is far from sufficient, but at least it is an essential uh, step. Uh, the Europeans are not naive uh, anymore. And once again, that dynamic uh, has been de facto sped up by the COVID-19 pandemic, by the rise of the Sino-US tensions, uh, etc. What is clear today that with the sanction adopted by the European Union, by the announcement of a better protection of our markets, combining uh, de facto openness and fairness, all of these aspects go uh, in the right uh, direction. Yet, I would uh, perfectly agree with uh, uh, Meyer that um, there is still the need of a, a so-called European awakening uh, that 
Europe is not at the mercy of China, that we have considerable leverages that we must all agree to use. Uh, no, Europe is not dependent on China. There is a mutual interdependence. And Chinese companies have a vital need to access the world's largest uh, markets. So we do have tools. What is very important from the European perspective and the European side is to be more self-confident and to have the political will to use the tools, to use the very many tools we have to, uh, of course, defend our interests, promote cooperation with the US. And if I may, in, in very short uh, mention, I would say that this is not, of course, against fighting China. This is not about criticizing Chinese people. This is about uh, opposing certain policies. And to be clear, uh, it's very, very important also to say that this is not a so-called, I don't know, Western alliance against China, a united front against China, but it should be a coalition based on mutual interests, defending common values, and doing so in a very inclusive manner. And as such, to be clear, uh, it's not only about Europe and the US, not only about European and North American countries, it's also about Asian, African, South American uh, countries, etc. And when, you know, Senior Director Rosenberger was just telling us from the White House that there is a uh, strong common values between um, the US and the EU, and then more policies on China could be um, planned, if not implemented. Do you think that sort of thinking would have a large enough audience in Europe? I think there could be an audience if uh, some already existing initiative uh, are strengthened. That's the case basically for the Alliance for Multilateralism that was initiated by France and Germany a few years ago. That initiative should be developed, strengthened, uh, and we should innovate uh, in it, etc. I think it's also very, very important for the Europeans uh, to be convinced that what we can do is to offer an alternative, especially to the developing countries. And we must make sure that uh, in, in terms of infrastructures, in terms of, of models, uh, etc., they don't they don't have to rely on China. They can make a choice. They can have alternative between some Chinese proposal uh, and some, let's say, European Americans and with our partners and, and, and allies in the region. Uh, offers an alternative. And I think this is something very, very important. There is also some, some sectors, some areas in which the European Union, of course, could do more, uh, in which we could learn a lot from our partner, be it uh, the United States, Japan, Australia. I'm thinking, for example, of, of military civil fusion. Uh, that's something that is uh, key today in China's national strategy that is maybe not taken enough into consideration uh, in Europe. And we need to do more because in terms of uh, economic competition, in terms of national security, it does matter. And once again, we can work all together with our American, Japanese, Australian, Canadian partners, etc. Well, thank you. If you just um, go back to the White House for the time being to get some you know, final thoughts, we have a few minutes left or uh, maybe a couple of points here. I mean, first of all, the EU-India summit is coming up. And of course, India is a strong partner of the United States uh, in the Quad Security Alliance together. What do you expect um, to be the message from this upcoming EU-India summit uh, from the White House's perspective? Well, thanks, Stuart. Um, I'll, I'll leave the messaging to the about the EU-India summit to the EU and India. Um, but you're absolutely right to point um, to the important role that India plays as a partner for the United States. Um, and, and let me sort of zoom out for one second here and pick up on something that Antoine said, that this is you know, not just about uh, the United States and, and Europe um, working on some of these issues together, but this is about partners um, around the world um, that uh, share many of our interests and our values. Um, and, and in some cases, some of our concerns about China's China's behavior. Um, one of the first things that um, you know that that President Biden did um, in his administration was to have a virtual Quad Leader Summit um, that was uh, convening the United States, uh, Japan, Australia, and India at the leaders level for the first time um, for a conversation about what these four democracies can do together. And um, they put out a, a statement with a number of. Um, really affirmative um, proposals, um, including on vaccine um, manufacturing, including on um, technology, um, including on climate, um, a number of really specific areas where they're working together. Um, I know that the EU recently just um, uh, developed its own Indo-Pacific strategy, 
um, which is, I think, another important um, piece here. And one of the things I think the United States is quite interested in um, is in deepening and, and seeing the deepening, really, um, of these relationships between Europe and the Indo-Pacific, between partners around the world. I think um, in many ways, the time of thinking about our partnerships and alliances simply in terms of geogra geography um, is, is really a bit, a bit dated. And whether we're looking at supply chains or technology cooperation um, or, or even on the economic front, there's a lot of things, a lot of opportunities for our partners and allies to be working together across geographic boundaries in new and different ways. And one of the things that the United States is trying to do is to actually help nurture and build out those kinds of um, those kinds of relationships, those kinds of networks, because we think it is in all of our interests um, to be able to do so. So we welcome things like the EU India Summit as a as a uh, you know a step um, or a, a marker along those lines, and we'd like to see it as being part of a broader strategy. If I could just add one one last piece here, um, which is that you've mentioned a few times, um, you know Taiwan. Um, and it, it's come up in, in both Antoine and, and the mayor's remarks um, a bit. And, and I think one piece here that's important is you know, we've also seen um, you know, increasing um, interest and attention from a number of um, European countries um, in terms of their own unofficial um, relations with Taiwan. I think the role of Taiwan, um, particularly the technology sector um, with semiconductors being such a critical element in our supply chains that underpin so much of our economy, so much of our technology. Um, and the realization is there's been a global chip shortage of the critical role that Taiwan is playing here, um, I think is, is an opportunity for a number of countries to, to deepen those unofficial um, relationships, along with that broader deepening um, with the, with the Indo-Pacific region. And looking forward, what can we expect from more potential interaction between the United States and China. I mean, of course, we have the Alaska talks and then um, Catherine Tai, the ambassador, also said that there was um, some kind of plan to meet with uh, Vice Premier Liu He to talk about trade. Um, are we going to see more interaction between Beijing and Washington in the rest of this year? Well, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, you know, we've seen a number of high level engagements already. The uh, President Biden's phone call with um, President Xi. Um, we saw, of course, uh, Secretary Blinken had an early phone call with Yang Jiechi, and then, as you noted, the Anchorage meetings. There's been a number of other calls um, uh, with with counterparts in China at a variety of levels. Um, you know, our lines of communication with Beijing are, are quite open, um, whether through our embassy uh, here in Washington, through um, our embassy in Beijing. Um, we have um, engagement with um, with Chinese officials. Um, on a range of areas where we see potential to cooperate. For Secretary Kerry visited Shanghai um, in the run-up to the Climate Leader Summit um, for a meeting with his counterpart, Xi Jinping. Um, and you know, they uh, you know, released a joint statement that memorialized um, some of the um, agreements that they made um, in that meeting. Um, we certainly continue um, to follow up, whether it's on North Korea, whether it's on Iran, whether it's on Afghanistan, on some of these areas um, where we have a shared interest in, in working with Beijing. And I would certainly expect to see as we go forward, um, continuing contact um, and communication at a range of levels. Look, we have a really big relationship with China and it's important that even while we have um, concerns um, that we have those open lines of communication. Honestly, that was one of the um, points that we sought to make clear in, in Anchorage, which is that um, we'll be candid in raising our concerns um, but that doesn't mean um, we're not going to be engaging. Um, we, we will engage um, China. Um, we need to do so from that position of strength um, that we've spoken about here. Um, but we certainly um, will anticipate continued um, engagement at a range of levels um, over the next year on the breadth of, of our relationship um, with China. The key for us is that those engagements um, be practical and they be results oriented. The question for us is always, what's our objective here? What are we trying to achieve? Um, that needs to be sort of the orienting principle as we are engaging with our counterparts. Um, we're not interested in just sort of um, dialogue for dialogue's sake, but we, we really wanna see results. And, and that for us is the key. What's the best way to achieve that? And um, I mean, if we are looking at European politics in the next 12 months, we are going to see elections in Germany 
and then uh, next year there will be an election in France. Uh, France, by the way, will also take up the presidency of the Council of the EU. How are these dynamics being taken into account, just very briefly, in, in Washington? I mean, when it comes to forging a sort of some sort of consensus on China policy. Absolutely. Well, you know, we, we all have our politics in our countries, um, and certainly we have them here in the United States as well. Um, one of the things that we've done extensively over the first um, three plus months of the Biden administration is um, really intensive discussions um, with our European um, allies and partners. Um, we've done a series of um, in-depth, what we've called um, virtual roadshows. The travel is still limited, of course, in COVID times, um, but we've had a range of sort of interagency conversations um, with key allies in, um, in a sort of virtual format um, to compare notes, not necessarily to reach agreements on what we're doing together, um, but to simply say, here's our assessment across the range of these issues. We want to hear your assessment. We want to understand and factor that into our thinking as we are developing out sort of the meat on the bones of our China strategy. It's really important for us to understand where our allies are at, how we can maximize our work together, um, and where we have more work to do. And so those intensive consultations, understanding the boundaries of debate, understanding where, um, you know, where policymakers stand across a range of fronts, has been really important as we are formulating our own strategy. We look forward to having those conversations going forward as there are elections or, or other um, you know, political markers in other countries. Um, you know, we certainly look forward to continuing those conversations um, and, and you know, evolving our policy um, and our approach as necessary. Thank you very much. And uh, here we conclude our panel discussion on China on transatlantic relationship vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, thank you once again for um, Senior Director Rosenberger. Thank you once again to Mayor Hrib and to Dr. Bondas. And we'll pass our session back to the studio. Thank you, Stuart. What we just heard in this discussion reminds me of what Fred Kemp stated in our introduction yesterday, that for Americans, the European Union will continue to be a partner of first resort as we all face rapid changes in a variety of global areas, China being one of them. China is a systemic rival for both the European Union and the United States. And while they have divergences in their policy approaches, the EU and the US are aligned in upholding democratic ideals, protecting fair trade practices, and promoting an ambitious climate agenda when engaging with China. The opportunities for transatlantic engagement span regions, sectors, and we have much more to come today and tomorrow in how we're stronger together through the EU-US Future Forum. A friendly reminder that you can be a part of these conversations too on social media using the hashtag EUFF2021. And that registration for joining these events is still open. Just go to AtlanticCouncil.org to download the Atlantic Council event app, where we have the latest agenda, speaker information, and updated info as well. We're going to stay with these themes. Maggie, you just mentioned what Fred Kemp said yesterday regarding China. We also heard yesterday Ambassador Lambrinidis state how the transatlantic relationship is built on a history of shared ideals regarding global security and rule of law. The European Union's primary body to address this common security and defense policy is the EU Military Committee, which is the highest military body set up within the Council, composing of the chiefs of defense of the member states, who are regularly represented by their military representatives. To expand on this further, we now welcome the chairman of the EU Military Committee, General Claudio Graziano, who joins us, who joins the EU-US Future Forum now in Spotlight. Good morning, everyone, and many thanks to the Atlantic Council and the European Union delegation to the United States for keeping up the great tradition of this important annual gathering. In my position of chairman of the highest military body in the European Union, I couldn't miss this opportunity to deliver, to deliver my point of view on European Union-United States relations, particularly in respect to the defense and security sector. The recent history has presented a series of unprecedented shared challenges, with the pandemic as a catalyst, not just for a dreadful acceleration of existing crises, but also as a trigger from brand new emerging threats, potentially or already affecting all of us. It comes as no surprise how no country or organization is currently equipped to successfully tackle all the challenges alone. 
in isolation. Not the United States, not the European Union, not NATO. This is why, as European Union, we have announced our investment in multilateralism and dialogue with like-minded partners with whom we share values and objectives for a safe order. And the Treaty Compass under development will only reinforce this trend. It is time for Brussels and Washington to join their effort in implementing a pragmatic common agenda, speaking the same language and earn back a trustworthy relationship with the Atlantic as the beating heart of global cooperation. On its side, was it the European Union ready to do for this a new bond? I would say, become less dependent from it. A paradox? Quite the opposite, as the only way a relationship will last if, uh, if it becomes a place where you firstly go to give and not a place where you go to take. This is one of the basic triggers for our quest for strategic autonomy, which is not an end, but the European Union's essential requirement for becoming and acting as a reliable security provider. In autonomy, when the situation mandates, but, in, but better in partnership, which remain our favorite choice in all feasible stances. This higher level of ambition would imply for the European Union the ability, for example, to undertake action where NATO or the United States may be likely to play a less active role in the future, like in our own neighbor, particularly in the Sahel and North Africa. In this sense, European Union autonomy would come as a complementarity and support into its alliance, making of the European Union a stronger European Union, European pillar of NATO, and a more steadfast partner of the whole international community, which in final should gladly welcome our approach towards strategic autonomy. On the other hand, Let's recall that the alternative to a more integrated and dependent Europe is definitely a less transatlantic one. And European Union playing the role of the follower instead of the one of the partner. On its side, I believe that also the, European, the United States will eventually expect more capable and mature allies. And all ones that remain reliant, with the result of taking off some pressure of NATO and embracing the Union, the union defense. Now there is a series of initiatives that the European Union and its member states must pursue for becoming more autonomous, and those benefit the European Union United States relationship, starting by making sure that its own mechanisms deliver tangible outputs, and the projects are coherent and focused on filling critical European and NATO common capability shortfall. To name a few, missile defense and unmanned aerial system, strategic and tactical airlift, surface and underwater capabilities, and hybrid means, including disruptive technologies, and of course, the much publicized enabled call military mobility. In regard to the latter one, it is of these days the decision at the European Union Council level to buy the United States, along with Canada and Norway, to get part in the related PESCO's project, something that could pave the way for more pragmatic forms of mutually beneficial cooperation between the European Union and the United States. In sum, effort to autonomy to become a more reliable, meaningful, and efficient partner. Particularly with the United States, a cooperation which has the potential to be a leading force in the whole security and defense scenario but not only. Italia, these are some of the key messages I convey on behalf of the Chief of Defense of European Union Member States to the Chairman of NATO's Military Committee, my direct counterpart in the alliance in our regular meeting and whenever deemed necessary. As for the United States Chot, I already had the opportunity to meet him in my current capacity and discuss issue of common concern. I am sincerely convinced that we should both seek more frequent interaction in the wake of the renewed approach by United States administration toward Europe, 
but also for the urgent call for all responsible stakeholders to contribute to the stabilization of global and regional security scenarios. In the meantime, as European Union Military Committee, we will continue to enjoy a fruitful collaboration with the United States military representation to the European Union here in Brussels, which also profit from this new impetus and interest. In this regard, let me finally recall the paramount relevance of keeping on engaging in dialogue at military level, as it has been often recognized as a very pragmatic way to solve problems as soon as they arise, foster confidence and find viable solutions. Concluding, I believe that there is a great opportunity grasped out there to truly join European Union and United States efforts and take our common challenges together. Thank you, General Graziano. Maggie, the same themes are emerging. Yes, as Katarina Soko just said to conclude this morning's panel on trade post-COVID just a bit ago, collaboration is required across the board. And this isn't just in recovering from a pandemic, but moving towards global security as well. Our growth in all areas is going to be more effective and successful if both the EU and the US approach the future together. Meanwhile, there are some topics that emphasize not just the need for global collaboration, but the reality of shared experiences at a local level, a citizen level, in both the European Union and the United States. For decades, the population of both has been slanting urban, with more and more people on both sides of the Atlantic opting to live in cities rather than in the countryside. However, this of course means that space is limited. And when a pandemic shuts down our ability to go outside, urban residents are left with unprecedented challenges. Yet, as we dive deeper, we find that these challenges are similar in both the EU and the US, and the paths to local resilience are similar as well. We have lessons to learn from each other in the past year of unexpected change. What are some of the best practices for local resilience? How can cities work together based on shared experiences? What we have learned, what have we learned from the adjustments of the past year? For our next discussion, we welcome representatives from three cities. His Excellency Kostas Bakayanis, the mayor of Athens, His Excellency Rafael Trzkowski, the mayor of Warsaw, Ambassador Nina Hachigian, deputy mayor of international affairs for the city of Los Angeles. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Daniel Stander, special advisor to the United Nations. And I think my guests need no further introduction. Thrilled to be joined today by Nina, Costas and Rafael, respectively of the cities of Los Angeles, Athens and Warsaw. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, as we heard in the introduction, um, I, li I like to think that resilience is always situational and it plays out on the ground. I want to start with you, Nina. Um, wow, from where I sat, what an incredible year to have just gone through. And it seemed at times almost as if the cities in the United States and your city in particular was maybe trying to figure out the pandemic on its own with relatively little support from the national government. How, how did you go about um, addressing that? What did that look like? And what does that mean for resilience locally? Thank you. And I'm really honored to be on this uh, various, uh, this panel with these very esteemed panelists. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, I can speak for all uh, cities, at least in the U.S., that we we really did have to just um, uh, figure it out uh, on our own, especially at the beginning. Um, we uh, are lucky to have, you know, a very forward-leaning uh, mayor in Mayor Garcetti. And so um, we acted fairly quickly for uh for an American city and shut down our city quickly. Um, but all, all the things that we had to do, set up testing, figure out how to feed seniors who were um, homebound, how to um, get our homeless shelter, or, you know, turn our rec centers, our, our play centers into homeless shelters um, and, uh, you know, get cash to, to uh, the most vulnerable of our, of our residents, um, all of those things were incredible logistical challenges mm -hmm. that we basically just had to do on our own. Uh, and uh, so at the beginning it was, you know, uh, a scramble as, as crises always are at the beginning. And then, you know, we slowly figured out uh, how to do it. We set up, you know, the biggest testing site in, in the US for a time um, at Dodger Stadium. 
um, with our own uh, firefighters uh, because you know they have some medical training. Um, and uh, you know, on and on, like, but but it, it was all hands on deck all the time. Um, we had a huge scramble for just you know masks and and uh, and PPE, uh, which we were trying to source from all over the place, and you know, in competition with other <laughs> with other cities in the United mm -hmm. States because there was no federal policy. Uh, so uh, so it was hard, it, you know, as it was in every city uh, with lots of you know lots of tragedy. Um, and we were actually hit, you know, the hardest just, you know, a few months ago. It's, uh, it's kind of even hard to believe where we were just, you know, four months ago. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it was, uh, it was a challenge. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're the ones who know, uh, you know, how to best help our residents because mm. we're here on the ground listening to them. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. And actually, it's one of the things I hadn't considered was p potentially that competition between some of yourself and some of the other cities. But equally, there's a sense of, I almost want to call it co-opetition, because you're all in this together. Um, and if I can come to you, Costas Bacchianis, and Athens, like Los Angeles, um, is a member of the Resilient Cities Network. And I can imagine you may be leaning in some way on um, um, on sister cities around the world, not saying that what works in one country is absolutely in one city is going to work in an, another, but we're all learning and, 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 and exchanging ideas. Um, interested in your perspectives, what it was like for you and the extent to which you tapped into a, perhaps a global network of cities to help you come through the pandemic? Absolutely. Networks have been extremely important to all of us. I mean, Mayor Garcetti chairs the C40, which has been a source of invaluable insight and the good practices that we have been sharing constantly over the past year, the year and a half. After all, it is a global problem. It's a global challenge, but it does require local solutions. And it is about working bottom up if one wants to be truly effective. Uh, in full disclosure, the pandemic came at a particularly cruel time for the city of Athens, just as we were emerging from a very long and deep economic and financial crisis, mm -hmm with a newly found sense of optimism and self-confidence, with our democracy stronger than ever, our institutions intact, and having isolated populists and extremists. However, uh, I think that one of the key lessons for all of us was that we actually learned to listen to the experts. We learned to actually make decisions based, based on facts and figures. We learned to actually put truth over partisanship and uh, politics. And I hope that this lesson stays with us for the years to come. From day one, uh, we had three main goals. Our first main goal was no, to make sure that no one is actually left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, urban centers are unfortunately uh, full of people who are um, unfortunate, who are unlucky, who are usually forgotten. Uh, so it was the key role of the city of Athens either through our new homeless shelter or through our new social services like uh, Help at Home Plus, where we actually uh, managed to deliver goods and aid uh, door to door um, to actually be next uh, to the people who are most in need, to those most vulnerable. Uh, number two, we invested a lot in the digital transformation of the city. Uh, this is where COVID was both a crisis and an opportunity. Uh, in just a few months, um, we achieved uh, uh, reforms that were lagging for a number of years. Uh, and number three, we actually uh, placed uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, keeping our economy alive and actually going a step further and creating incentives for our economy, especially for our small uh, and medium businesses. Uh, we managed to unlock uh, European funds that are going to be extremely useful um, in the days to come and in the weeks to come as we return to normal normalcy. And of course, uh, there is a wider agenda for all of us, a wider agenda that all cities uh, share, which has to do with the climate uh, crisis, or to be more exact, the climate emergency. We all know that cities are responsible for 70% of CO2 emissions. So it's about reclaiming and liberating uh, quality public space. It's about uh, sustainable mobility. Uh, the 20th century saw cities built around cars. The 21st century needs to see cities built around human beings. So mm -hmm. as you see, at the end of the day, everything that unites us is much more than actually what divides us or what separates us. Uh, and it's 
very important that we actually stay true uh, and we remain faithful to our alliances if we actually want to be of uh, use to our citizens. So much there that resonates and that I want to come back to around the comparison between COVID and climate and around remaining relevant. But what I want to pick up on right now is um, one lesson that you mentioned was listening to experts. But one of the things that came through really clearly was listening to people. Um, you know, and if you will, uh, you know, the cradle of democracy in Greece. And it's lovely to see you not just campaigning on that, but delivering on that. And if I can turn to Rafa now, um, thinking through the relationship between listening to the people and delivering solutions that meets their needs, whilst at the same time standing on a global stage working with your national governments, sometimes um, we can see that national um, priorities are in opposition perhaps to local priorities. I'd be very interested in hearing from you how you have, um, Rafael, um, dealt with some of those tensions at a time when your people have needed you most. Yes, hello to everybody. Good morning to you in, in the United States. Good afternoon to us in Europe. Uh, hello, Costas, Calispera. Uh, yes, well, I mean, th there were tensions between uh, local governments and national governments, and especially in Poland, where our conservative government uh, does not like us, to put it mildly. And unfortunately, lots, lots of things and relations between, be between us became tense and there was quite a lot of competition. At the beginning, you know, I mean, it was chaotic and we understood it because, you know, everyone was overwhelmed. So we decided to do everything in sync with the national government. We were repeating what they were uh, advising us because it is the national government which is responsible for emergency and it is the national government which is all the information at hand. But then later on with the second and the third wave, we decided to take the responsibility into our own hands. You know, I'm responsible for 11 hospitals myself. So we started buying equipment, we started getting ventilators ourselves. Now there's this huge thing about vaccination. So we're organizing our own places in which stadiums in which uh, we can actually vaccinate people. And we are also organizing our own experts because uh, to, to put it mildly, we were a bit uh, surprised by the level of chaos that we were confronted on the national level. And now, uh, yes, I mean, we were trying to respond to what the people were telling us on the ground, especially our specialists dealing with the hospitals, but also our entrepreneurs, also people who were asking us questions how to actually implement some of the restrictions. And, and we decided to do it on our own, you know, uh, add certain specificity to it, be a bit quicker on the ground than the national government. Uh, and that's what we were doing throughout the crisis. And of course, you know, being in contact with our friends, through various networks, um, uh, C40, Eurocities, but also Bloomberg Harvard Initiative, where we were in sync with some of our colleagues in the United States, allowed us to, uh, to benchmark, to exchange information, to exchange our views and experiences. And it helped a lot in organizing our response to COVID. And uh, in, many, in many places, we were ahead of the national government by simply preparing, for example, for the vaccination process, we knew how to do uh, the preparation better than the national government. We were ready and we were just ready to receive vaccinations. For example, now we have this massive vaccination program where we set up the, the places three or four weeks before the government. Now we're just waiting for them to, to, to give us a vaccination and tomorrow we will start registering people and in a week we will start this massive program of vaccination. So we are trying to downplay these emotions between local governments and national governments. You know, you can see them all around the world and we decided to be closer to the people and actually uh, be on the ground and be quicker uh, in response time uh, to, to the government. And in certain instances, thanks to uh, the experiences, exchange of experiences with, with our friends, we were able to be more effective. Well, thank you. And, and we need that agility because it's at the cold face where everything is most acutely felt. Um, and, and I wanted to pick up on something that Costas mentioned, which was making the comparison. He mentioned C40. Um, and the pandemic necessarily is a multinational, by definition, issue that we all need to address together. The climate crisis or the climate emergency, similarly so. If I could come back to Nina, um, and I, I, I'm always struck in these conversations around resilience that no city in the world is what I would describe as a single hazard city or a single peril city. We all exist with multiple shocks and stresses, whether it be climate, in, in your case in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, in California, um, with seismic risk. How do you think about juggling the multitude of um, shocks and stresses and how they come together in order to plan for them locally and 
and respond to them as you need to. I think, I think you've, you know, you've hit on the key thing, which is that resilience has to be local. It has to be even more local than a city. It really has to be, in our case, at least neighborhood by neighborhood, because, um, uh, you know, people will be able to respond differently. I mean, we, we actually need, you know, small, small areas of the city to, to have, um, to take responsibility for, you know, their own neighbors, because they're the ones who know who has a dog, you know, who has, who can't get out of the house, who, you know, so in the case of an earthquake, um, the, you know, the more, the more local that we can push down resources, uh, earthquake kits and, and neighborhood hubs for, for emergency, the better. And it was true in the pandemic too. Um, we, uh, for example, with our vaccination plan, we're lucky to have um, a lot of vaccines. And, um, but you know, if we design a system that is uh, for people with cars and with access to the internet and with the ability to take off a time of their workday to get a vaccine, we will be missing um, a huge, maybe more than half of the population of Los Angeles which, which doesn't have a car, isn't necessarily well connected to the internet uh, and can't take time off work. So we have to have different solutions for different um, parts of the community. And we figure that out by listening and by, um, by working with community groups who know their neighborhoods extremely right. well. So with the vaccine, we have big sites um, uh, like, in, like in Warsaw. And, and then we also have these very agile mobile teams that go directly to neighborhoods that have been the hardest hit uh, by COVID uh, to make sure that those folks are getting uh, getting access to the vaccine as easily as possible. Yeah, that makes that makes good sense. I mean, at the end of the day, resilience is about communities. Um, but, um, but I'm also conscious that communities exist at every scale, right? And so we have our neighborhood communities, we have our citywide, our regional communities, our national and indeed our international communities. If I come back to Costas, um, I would love to hear from you, what do we do to strengthen the relationships between those local and regional actors and the international actors in order to build transnational resilience? Is there a role for local actors there, Kostos? Oh, yes, clearly. Uh, there is a, lo a role for local actors and there's a role for local actors for three reasons. Uh, number one, uh, local actors are actually within uh, society. We are the closest democratic uh, institution to society itself. Number two, local actors, by definition, if they want to survive and if they want to be successful, they have to actually uh, form alliances that cross ideological party or other political uh, divides that we, it's all about transcending uh, even ourselves. Uh, and number three, it's about real solutions to real problems. So I think there is a catalytic uh, role for local uh, actors, but uh, it's very important to stress, and I'm also very conscious of Rafael's presence in our panel, that it also has to do with values. It has mm -hmm. to do with democratic values. It has mm -hmm. to do with our shared belief system. And we must be very, very clear and not make any compromises when it comes to the democracy itself, because we have seen democracy under threat over the last few years, whether through populism or whether through extremism. And we know very well that democracy has to be defended. Uh, we are very optimistic because we have positive news coming from the United States and from the new administration. Uh, we have positive news coming from from different uh, countries in Europe. So it is about actually going out there uh, and fighting for what we believe in. Uh, and local governments and local authorities have an extra advantage that we can actually be, be more persuasive because we actually deliver uh, to the people. We actually we are actually helpful to the people in a very concrete and tangible manner. Yeah, I, I have heard it said on numerous occasions, it's countries that sign treaties, but it's cities that actually deliver. Um, so if I could then come to wrap up, because I agree with everything that's been said here, I wonder what, if anything, is missing, or to put it slightly differently, if there was an ask of the international community, what would you be asking for in order to foster the kind of transnational resilience that we're looking for? 
Well, I mean, first of all, you have to uh, you have to uh, understand that we in Europe uh, we are very much interconnected, and in a certain sense, we do create a transnational community. I mean, now, for example, there is this huge recovery fund that will be distributed by the European Union, and now what we are doing as cities in Poland, but also in Europe. We are making sure that this money is not going to be distributed according to political criteria, because yeah. Costas is absolutely right that there is a question of values. I mean, somehow populists do not really win in local elections that often because people make much more uh, pragmatic decisions. So now we're fighting in Poland with the government, which simply wants to distribute money according to political criteria to distribute it equally so that we can actually you know, use the money for the real revolution, green revolution, investing in in, uh, in green solutions and in innovation and in, in, in making Europe digital and so on and so forth. So, of course, we need to cooperate. And that's what we're doing, we're creating pressure on the European institutions together uh, through our networks so that the money is used effectively. And we can also do it on an international scene. I mean, C40 is a wonderful example where we can actually get our heads together uh, with Eric, Nina, say hi to Eric. Uh, and with all of our colleagues in order to send uh, the right message. I mean, in order to uh, synchronize uh, what we say and what we do in order to benchmark better, in order to exchange uh, our own experiences, which, which can make uh, us uh, use the money more effectively and then demonstrate then to uh, both uh, the European institutions, to international institutions, to lenders, to banks and so on, that we are the ones who really know how to spend the money and invest it because now, in this deep crisis, we do have a chance to use it for our benefit and transform our cities. And that's exactly the mission that we have before us. And uh, if we want to do it right, we got to do it together. Abs yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear you bring in the financial aspect here because um, Costa's talked about solutions and solutions don't just come from thin air. Um, they need innovation, but they also need innovative finance. So if I could come back to Nina, um, when you think about accessing capital, public capital, private capital to drive innovative solutions, whether it be to tackle the pandemic or whether it be to tackle other global crises like the climate crisis, um, how do you as a city think about playing um, and accessing that global, global capital base? Uh, well, I have to say that, first of all, it's, it's you know, uh, the Biden administration is a huge breath of fresh air, and it is so wonderful to feel like we're being supported by the federal government and not, uh, you know, attacked uh, either, you know, personally or legally or, or whatever. So, so that's number one, is, is we have a federal government that's coming through with big uh, aid packages and making us solvent again. Um, you know, we have to balance our budget. Uh, and and they uh, they have listened to us and and are delivering uh, uh, you know financially what we need. Um, we've done a few things uh, again uh, and and in concert with with C40 cities. And I I should say you know from our point of view that that network that international network of mayors that it was started for climate but but became for a while a COVID uh, a COVID network was um, really invaluable. And I don't think people understand the degree to which we. we you know, or we're every day talking to our international uh, brothers and sisters because at the time we felt all alone uh, in the United States doing it on our own, but we knew that cities across the world were, were, were sharing it with us. Um, but we, we've done things like start a global bus consortium for electric buses so that, you know, LA alone may not move the needle with the market, but if we have a whole bunch of uh, um, local governments all together pooling what they need for electric buses, we can send a signal to the market. So that's one example of, of getting trying to trying to change the, the market for private finance um, in, in the climate situation. Yeah, thanks again for sharing that. I'd, I'd like to stay with that theme of finance, but also bring in this notion of principles and come back to you, Costas, because I think it's not just about the principles of democracy, while that is, of course, in, in my mind, sacrosanct. Um, it's also in this resilience uh, context about um, social equity, social justice, and those who are most vulnerable um, to the impacts of shocks and stresses and the least able to bounce back. So. I wonder if you could talk us through in your community um, how you support or how you make sure we channel the funds to those that most need it to remain resilient to the potential risks that we face. Well, it is about livability, it is about sustainability, it is about resilience, but it is also about affordability. Uh, and we need to put our money where our mouth is. 
Now, the good news is, uh, number one, uh, the European Union has moved forward uh, very quickly with the RRF, uh, which, which uh, Rafael mentioned uh, a bit earlier. Uh, we are actually very fortunate in Greece. We have an excellent cooperation with the central government, which has actually uh, proposed um, a holistic uh, plan that, uh, from what I understand, has actually been very warmly welcomed in Brussels. Uh, but we're also very fortunate uh, because we have the European Green Deal. Uh, there hasn't been so much discussion about it uh, recently, but we are talking about a project, a three-decade project that can actually transform uh, the European Union. So moving forward, uh, where do we come in as local governments? We come in because we are able, as I said earlier, to actually deliver uh, bottom-up. Uh, for you, maybe Athens is the Acropolis. For you, maybe Athens is our historical center. Uh, but it's much more than that. It's 129 neighborhoods, 129 communities, and we have to be there. We have to be there with the people, amongst the people. Uh, let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, we have street work right now in the city, 24-7. There are a group of experts and scientists who literally walk the city uh, and are next to those who are homeless. Uh, we even test the homeless uh, as we speak right now during the day and during the night for COVID. Or let me give you a second example. Uh, we have uh, we created a new homeless shelter. Uh, we are able to um, host up to 400 people in dignified conditions. Uh, no, the problem hasn't been solved, but we have taken a major step forward. And the good news is that we did it all together. It was a city, it was civil society, it was the private sector. We all joined forces. I would like to leave it here, um, um, but I want to just uh, end with a, a passing word. Um, resilience, it seems, is absolutely locally defined. We all, though, sit on a global stage, and we know that in times of crisis, it's our international networks as well as our local communities that sustain us. Um, Nina Hachian, Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles, Kostas Bakoyanis, Mayor of Athens, and Rafael Tchaikovsky, Mayor of Warsaw, Thank you very much for joining us today for an enlightened debate about the role of local government in delivering in transnational resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Daniel. Thank you, Mayor Bakuyanis, Mayor Trochowski, and Ambassador Hachigian. And welcome back to the Atlantic Council headquarters in Washington, DC. A friendly reminder that you can still join the conversation on social media using the hashtag EUFF2021 and you can get the latest updates and speaker information by RSVPing for the event at AtlanticCouncil.org. As you just heard, one thing that cities on both sides of the Atlantic have long strived for is finding innovative ways to remain successful and clean in an urban environment. This cues the next portion of this future forum, where our following set of discussions explore EU-US cooperation, not just in the COVID crisis, but in the climate crisis. The green transition and combating climate change has long been a key topic in the transatlantic sphere, dominating both headlines and policies since before the turn of the century. The climate crisis continues to be a priority even amidst the pandemic, and both the European Union and the United States are key players in working towards a cleaner, greener future. Here to discuss more on how the green transition might be shaped, I welcome CNN's Farid Zakaria, who joins us in dialogue with Ms. Annalena Baerbach, co-leader of Germany's Alliance 90 party, and also known as the Greens. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a huge pleasure and opportunity for all of us, but for me uh, personally. And so I will, uh, I will take the opportunity to dive right in. I think uh, none of you are interested uh, in hearing my views on, on this when we have Annalena Baerbach with us. Uh, let me first extend a warm welcome uh, from the Atlantic Council and more figuratively from the United States to Annalena Baerbock. Hello, good uh, afternoon from Berlin or good morning to you over the Atlantic. So it's really a pleasure being with you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So let me first ask you, um, we are all speculating, uh, the world is speculating on the fact that you may be the next chancellor of Germany. Um, how likely is that? Give us a sense of, uh, of your odds. 
Well, because uh, the voting system is a bit different across the Atlantic, uh, we have a multi-party system and most of the times coalition. And my party, the Greens, has been for a long time like on third or even fourth row in the polls. Uh, so for us, it's really historic that we even nominated a person being a candidate for the chancellery. Currently at the polls, uh, we are on the top, but we still have five months to go to the election. So it's everything in and everything is possible. But at the end, the voters have luckily in democracy the final say. Tell us why you think you are at the top. Um, this is very unusual, and if it's unusual for a Green Party, even though the Greens in Germany have been uh, strong for a while. What does it say about uh, where Germany is, and what does it say particularly about the two mainstream parties, uh, the SPD, which is now you know, essentially a, a shadow of its former self, but also the CDU? Well, most importantly, I would say that it says a lot about the world, the situation of the world and Europe. We have seen like a green wave, not a political green wave, but a green wave uh, over the last uh, five, six years after the Paris Agreement uh, on climate uh, policy. And uh, therefore, the question that the markets of the future, the economy of the future is carbon neutral, has uh, find its path all over the world, but especially within Europe. And uh, for a couple of years, therefore, the question of climate neutrality is on the top agenda for many Europeans. We as a Green Party have stood for this uh, environmental issue since we have been founded 40 years ago. And on the other hand, I believe that in societies, you always have this momentum of a historic change, like it was in the past in a, after the Second World War, the building of our nation. And then again, in the 90s, the uh, reunification of our country, the again at this kind of uh, crossroad uh, where we have to take our future in our own hands, building a carbon neutral society together with a social just society. And this gives the momentum of change for our country and uh, the Greens stand for this change, for this hope, whereas uh, other parties stand more for the status quo. And that's why we have a big movement within our society for the hope and for the change. So what do you think will change if you became chancellor? Uh, the world has, as you say, got used to uh, Chancellor Merkel, who has been very steady, uh, but in a sense has been part of a very familiar world for us. If, if the Greens were to come into power, you were to become chancellor, particularly for Germany and its relation to the outside world, what would change? Well, I'm not standing for changing everything, but uh, bringing big parts of society in a better future, meaning building really a carbon neutral and social just society and not just working from one momentum to the others, but have a long-term vision. On the other hand, uh, my country um, is uh, based in a integrated and united Europe. And our historical um, path is um, being connected with the rest of the world. And this is a tradition which is also strong connected to a Green Party. So building up a carbon neutral social just society within a integrated Europe, working on the peace of the world is uh, the foundation of my party and also my big uh, vision for the next decade. Part of the Green Party's history has been a fairly sub a substantial criticism of the United States. I think particularly if I think back uh, 30 years, uh, would has that changed or do you believe that uh, the, the, the part of the nature of the Green Party is to be much more critical of US uh, uh, dominance of the world or status in the world and of the very tight alliance that the United States and Germany have historically enjoyed? Well, I think it's a broader picture, like uh, the Green Party, but it was back 40 years ago. Actually, it's a co coincidence, but it's a funny one. 
uh, we were founded uh, in 1980. This was just the year when I was born. So you see like how long our tradition uh, goes back and also how much our party has changed as like people in our country have changed over the last uh, four decades. But when we were founded, um, it was like the foundation of different movements. It was a strong women movement fighting for equal rights for women, but also for human rights. It was a strong environmental movement coming also from an anti-nuclear uh, momentum, especially after then in the 80s, Chernobyl uh, happened, which really was a strong point in our history. But it was also built on a peace movement because of our past, because of our um, history. And in this uh, mixture of different uh, movements, uh, the party's DNA was also always founded in um, the question of uh, freedom and peace and, and human rights. And this is, I think, uh, which, you, which you are connecting uh, on the question of also the relationship uh, with the US, but also Russia on the other hand, because uh, many people in Germany had a strong fear of being split between this Cold War, between uh, two countries, uh, which are uh, fighting against each other and Germany is just in the middle, Europe is just in the middle. Um, but we have like uh, over the 40 years, because for us it was so important uh, to be a party of peace, but also being a party of human rights that for especially the agenda of the responsibility to protect, which was a big um, um, uh, thing also for the United Nation. This is our foundation of saying, democracy, liberal democracy, have to fight for human rights, sometimes also with military measures to prevent genocide. And on the other hand, every military action has to be founded on international public law, which is also set up in our constitution because of our past. And this is a bit the history, how we also followed NATO, the development of NATO. But, believe, but we believe that uh, a strong U European Union and a strong transatlantic relation also based on NATO is um, our common ground, how we can build the future together. Do you agree with uh, Donald Trump that uh, Germany should be paying 2% of its uh, uh, GDP into uh, its defense to meet that uh, NATO guideline? Do you think it is appropriate? I think uh, that it's very uh, not only appropriate, but also needed that Europeans and therefore Germans have to take a more responsibility for our own security. Um, back in the 90s, Bush senior um, said to our German chancellor, um, why don't we start a partnership in leadership? But in the 90s, Germany was not ready. We were, we were not reunited. Many other Europeans were a bit afraid of a strong Germany again after the Second World War. But I think now, uh, almost 30 years later, it's really the time to step up a, a, new, uh, a new step uh, to set up this uh, partnership in leadership between uh, Europe and the US. This means also more responsibility and security issues. But I have my doubt that the 2% target of the NATO, which was set up before also Mr. Trump, um, is still the state of the art because it's related to the GDP, as you know. And this means that in a crisis like now, where everything is kind of unsecure, rationally, we have to invest less because 2% of a GDP, which uh, decreased, is not the same capacities as when the um, economy is growing. So I, for me, from my point of view, the question is what kind of capacities do we need? What kind of capacity can Europe bring? But it's not a good figure to connect it to a GDP, which is so depending on the economic growth. And secondly, we have new threats and challenges like in cyber uh, relation. So it's different to have tanks or be really uh, responsible and really secure in the cyber world. Would it be fair to say what you're describing is a kind of uh, a Green Party and your leadership that would, I think, be reassuring to most Americans in the sense that it seems to affirm the Atlantic Alliance, affirm NATO, uh, you know, uh, affirm the importance of, uh, of thinking about human rights. 
And so I'm wondering, this, this, is, the, the, this moment happened before when Joschka Fischer became foreign minister and people who had worried that in that case, I think he was a little older than you, so had in the 1980s thrown a couple of Molotov cocktails uh, and uh, in anti-American demonstrations, that he turned out to be actually a very pro-NATO, pro, uh, even pro-US uh, foreign minister. Would you say that this is a model you look at favorably, that of Joschka Fischer in government? Well, he's part of my uh, party. And actually, when he was foreign minister, just at this moment, I joined the party. This was uh, in 2004, actually like a really emotional moment for me because it was uh, the 1st of May in 2004 when uh, Europe did its enlargement to the east. So um, European countries joined the EU, especially from the east. And I come from a region around Berlin. It's called Brandenburg. Uh, it was eastern Germany. And it has a direct border over the Oder River to Poland. And my own grandfather fought like in the winter of uh, 45 at this river, at this border. And I was there standing in 2004 on this bridge, which obviously was rebuilt between Poland and Germany when Joschka Fischer as foreign minister, together with his colleague from the Polish side, was celebrating again the reunification of Europe. And this was really the momentum when I thought, wow, we are standing off the shoulders, not only on Joschka Fischer, but also of our grandparents who made it possible that countries who were enemies are again, not only in peace, but in friendship together. And this is what the grounds where I'm standing on fighting for Europe, which uh, lives in friendship in a common integrated uh, market. And for this, we need institutions like the EU, like a strong transatlantic relation, because this wouldn't have been possible, our reunification without the support uh, from the US. So it's yeah, building on our history, but this is really important for me, otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to become a chancellor. Uh, history is nothing which just flows like a river. It's always a momentum where people have to take the courage to build the future actively. So it doesn't make sense to say, I just follow up what Joschka Fischer did 15 years ago. I take the best from the past to bring it in the future. And coming back to your question also with the nature, for example, I think the most important thing is to put up a new strategic agenda. What is the role of the NATO in the year of 2021 and not in 2004? And we have unluckily faced Ukraine situation. We have seen that what we believed back in 2004, that um, there's never again war in Europe is not true. And therefore we have to redefine our strategic goals within NATO, within the EU, and uh, coming up with the, the new challenges ahead, also fulfill it with resources, for example, with military expansions. But this is also important for 2021. The threats are not only cyber, it's the uh, climate crisis, it's COVID, it's pandemias worldwide. So for me, it's so important that it's not building a new wall around Europe or a transatlantic uh, region, but really seeing that we work together in a world of institution of strong human rights, but being aware that we have other countries like China, like Russia, who are also in a geostrategic uh, fight with us. So let's talk about Russia. Um, do you believe that the European Union is doing enough to support um, Ukraine, to support uh, the countries on Ukraine's border like Poland? Uh, or should there be more efforts made to really make both Russia pay some kind of a price for what it's done and to deter further actions? The Russians have only two weeks ago massed 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border. Um, I believe that the problems of the last year from the European Union was that we didn't do an active foreign policy. There wasn't an active role of the EU 
And this is due to the lack of an active German foreign policy, because Germany is the biggest player in the EU. And it's crucial that if the EU wants to be strong, if the EU wants to play its international role and also its role in its own neighborhood, then it needs a strong, open, but active German foreign policy. It's not about Germany telling the others what to do, but if we are behaving very passively, it's hard for the others. And it also needs a strong um, interaction between Germany and France. And most uh, uh, importantly, also with our European neighbors. And this didn't happen, to say it very frankly, in the last years. The Baltic state, Poland, even though I have also disagreement with uh, some politics of the governments, especially in Poland. But anyhow, we are a, a friendship group together. And they said, we, we are afraid, actually. We are afraid because of the situation in the Ukraine. And Germany wasn't standing really like strong on their sides. And give you a practical example um, for that. Uh, after the uh, the invasion of the Crimea and uh, Eastern Ukraine, the European Union set up a new energy um, policy saying we, we cannot be so dependent anymore on Russia, because if we cannot heat in winter when Russia like quits um, our connection of gas, it's really hard to say we have a strong tone on sanctions because I know we depend on them. So therefore, the European Union said we have to be more independent, especially with our imports of uh, energy. And we set up a new regulation on, on, on this. And they set up sanction. But then from the um, Kreml, they pushed for this pipeline Nord Stream 2, which is very known uh, to you as well. And unluckily, the German government from the Ministry for um, Industry, but also from the Chancellery said, well, this is a pipeline which is like just on economic interest. It has no political dimension. And this was totally wrong. And with this pipeline, with this indirect or even direct support from the German government, all the sanctions we put in place because of Trumeria were kind of contradicted. And this is not a stringent uh, foreign policy. And this is something I have uh, criticized uh, all over the last years. And this is also something I think has to change in the future. It has to be a common European policy where everybody is standing together. So what would you do with Nord Stream? For me, we cannot finalize this project. The problem is that it's only, there's already a pipeline underneath the Baltic uh, Sea. There's already the connection pipeline throughout my region where I live uh, down to the Czech um, Republic. Um, but this pipeline contradicts our sanctions, so it cannot go in place, it cannot start its action, especially because it's pretty clear that after a couple of years, if we have gas via this pipeline, there will be a cut of the pipeline going through Ukraine. And this is a new security threat for Ukrainians, and therefore this, uh, this pipeline cannot they cannot go any gas uh, through this, this pipeline because we have big security problems otherwise on Ukraine. I think it's really important to be also like uh, in the front row of action, not being so passive on this project. That actually we modernize the pipeline via Ukraine. This was also a request from the Ukrainians for many, many years. We need um, hydrogen in Europe to be carbon neutral in the future. There's a high potential in Ukraine for renewable energy, for wind and solar, that we have already this pipeline there to transfer now fossil gas. We can set it up for green hydrogen pipeline in the future. And I think, so it's not just being against this pipeline Nord Stream 2, it's on the other hand, really enabling Ukrainian transporting green gas in the future to the European Union. Chancellor Merkel says that on, uh, with regard to China, uh, the European Union, Europe, Germany have a different view than the United States, I think suggesting that it would be less uh, uh, combative, less, uh, less uh, tough. Um, Germany has huge exports to China. Um, will you, how will you balance Germany's economic relationship with China with the need to deter China uh, from external uh, expansion, 
or to speak out when China does things internally, whether in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang, uh, do you think you will be able to be um, tougher than Chancellor Merkel on China? Well, for me, it's not human rights on one side and economic interest on this side. If, if you set up the world in black and white, this is not reality. There are so many colors uh, in between and there are also so many challenges uh, in between. This makes it so difficult talking about international relation because you, you, you cannot, as a, as a democracy, as a union of uh, um, human rights and values, you, you cannot say either values or economic interests. So you have to bring them in balance. And this means sometimes you have to fight very strong on human rights. For example, if, if we look uh, at the situation of uh, forced labor of the, in German it's Uguren, I don't know if it's the English word. Um, yeah. um, so we, we can say as Europeans on our common European market, um, we don't have products being produced out of forced labor. So there we defend our human rights, our values very strong. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean saying there is no import export anymore between Europe and China. This is out of the world. Uh, we are obviously also depending on the relationship uh, with them. But we can say we don't take certain projects, uh, products out of these regions. Um, so this is always like balancing human rights, balancing our values with economic interest. And I would say we are not like really apart on this point, like we as Europeans, but also maybe we as Greens with the common, uh, with the current um, US administration, because you have also now intensified the dialogue on uh, the question of climate. And on the other hand, have a strong tone on human rights and also the question um, of uh, uh, tariffs. So I think uh, I'm there are similar um, um, on a similar field than your current uh, new administration. Um, Germany is facing a, a worse situation with COVID than I think anyone would have guessed, uh, certainly uh, from the first uh, few weeks of, and months of the crisis. Is part of that, the problem here that the European Union uh, decided to take on the issue of vaccines, uh, basically taking on a public health function that has traditionally been handled by the member states. Um, Germany has a fantastic public health system, but this was the vaccines were all handled by the European Union. Uh, was this a case of the European Union overstepping its, its, its boundaries and doing something it should not have done? No. They have a really hard no, um, because if you are an internal market, if you are a union, then it's not possible of saying, well, we do our own business uh, here in Germany and the Baltic states uh, or smaller states, they can do uh, what they want. Because this would have meant, because they didn't have their own vaccination productation uh, in their countries, uh, that we say, we don't care what happens, uh, for example, uh, in Poland. And we are what I was describing. We don't have borders anymore within, luckily, the European Union. Um, like people I know, they, they have family in Poland. They come to Germany and work here. So um, it was very important that the European Union took all together, all our 27 countries together, a strategy on the vaccination. There have been mistakes um, about the question okay, how much do we buy? But buying it together was very, very important for us. And I think also as a model uh, for, the, for the world. And now we have to take the next step that it's not just the EU, it's not just the US, but we have also a common and shared responsibility for the whole world that everybody can get vaccinated uh, in the upcoming uh, months. Um, when you look at the Biden administration, um, and, and the US in general. Uh, what do you think are the, the challenges you face, the different dis disagreements you will have? What do you think are the opportunities? You know, what, what, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, if you have a message for Americans about where, what, what, German, what a Germany under you would look like, what, should, what is your message? 
we have a bright future together if we work together on a transatlantic green deal. I think there's a chance ahead of us for both sides of the Atlantic because with the new Biden administration, uh, you, you invest now from all what I've read and heard and uh, uh, seen, investing really in a future of a carbon neutrality together with a strong movement on social justice. And this is actually the same idea we are having on the other side of the Atlantic as the European Union with the Green Deal. And I think there's an incredible possibility of showing we can work together on the future project, which is the most important future project for our kids and grandchildren. And on the same tone and level, we can bring something to the world which makes the world a better place and also with strengthen our democracies. Because it's really crucial that uh, democracies show within the upcoming months that we can not only fight a pandemic with democratic measures, but also the biggest threat like the climate crisis um, as democracies. And um, so it will strengthen the climate, it will strengthen the welfare, but also, if we do it right, international institution and the rule of law worldwide. Um, let me ask you finally, there is uh, one visible uh, uh, legacy of America's historic relationship with Germany, which is American troops uh, in Germany. Donald Trump wanted to reduce them. Now they seem to be back. Are you comfortable with American troops being stationed in Germany? Do you think 20 years from now, it, it's, it would still be appropriate? Well, um, we are together in an alliance. And um, if we spend a certain amount of our money for uh, military interest, I think the most or the biggest responsibility also with regard of tax player, payers and society is to be most efficient with this money going into the military budget, because if it goes in the military budget, it doesn't go in the housing, in the healthcare, in the school budget. So efficiency is really crucial for me and working together very closely between all the European uh, members within NATO and the Americans means the highest efficiency. And therefore it's very good that we also work close together with soldiers, with uh, military equipment in Germany, in other European countries, uh, but also yeah, over the, the Atlantic. So yes, in a very efficient way where we don't duplicate our structures and where Europeans take up more responsibility in the upcoming months for themselves. But that's a yes. Yes. Annalena Baerbock, a pleasure to have you. I think this would be a very, very interesting conversation for most Americans. Uh, we're very grateful to you for having joined us. Um, I think I'd, it's now time for me to turn it back to the studio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Baerbock, Ms. Makaria. It's exciting to hear the opportunities of cooperation between the EU, EU and the US and Germany's role in transatlantic um, It's hard to overstate the importance of strategic cooperation in the green position. Climate change is a crisis that knows no borders and will impact how we live, how we work, and how we look to the future. The urgency of the climate crisis has reflected, uh, is reflected in the priorities outlined in the 2020 joint statement released by the Commission and the EU High Representative, which highlighted climate and biodiversity loss as the defining challenges of this time. The European Green Deal launched an ambitious agenda to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And the US has expressed its commitment to similarly ambitious climate goals with its re-entrance into the Paris Agreement and recent announcement of the new nationally determined contribution during the Leaders' Summit on Climate last month. This nationally determined contribution stated that the US will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. Working across the Atlantic on climate will only underestimate the delivery 
of unprecedented targets the EU and the US have set, underscored. We're honored now to welcome two guests who are driving agenda every day to address the top climate priorities on both sides of the pond. Before doing that, we'd like to reflect briefly on what Ambassador Lambernitis and Fred Kemp said at the very beginning of this, which was reflecting on the transatlantic relationship, its foundations out of times of strife, and how both the EU and the US and the world at large are currently in a time of strife, that we are rebuilding out of this pandemic, and the themes that we have witnessed through these dialogues, through these discussions, through this future forum, only emphasize and underscore this theme of the United States and the European Union are stronger when they are together. That's exactly right, Travis. Thank you so much. I also would love to invite our audience again to join the conversation on social media using hashtag EUFF2021. You can also still register for the event at AtlanticCouncil.org and download the Atlantic Council event app through Socio, where you can find a complete agenda, live stream, speaker information announcements, and you can also submit questions. Here in just a second, we're going to turn to a dialogue between Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm and European Commissioner for Energy Kadri Simpson, moderated by former US Ambassador to the European Union Richard Morningstar. And after that, we will spotlight yet another area of transatlantic cooperation, but maybe not one that you're thinking about, one that actually expands far beyond the atmosphere that we currently are standing in in the Atlantic, studio, the Atlantic Council Studios here in Washington, DC. Stay tuned to hear more about how the US and the EU work together in orbit, in space, on the moon, and beyond, featuring the Associate for International and in Interagency Relations from NASA. I'm now very excited to welcome our next guests and turn to Ambassador Morningstar to kick off our next dialogue on a new chapter for EU-US leadership. Good morning, everybody, to those joining from the United States, and good afternoon uh, to those in Europe. Uh, I'm Richard Morningstar, the founding chairman of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council and a board director, also a former ambassador to the European Union. Uh, it's my really a huge honor uh, to welcome you all to today's panel, uh, a new chapter for US-EU climate leadership, aligning strategies and actions. I also have the, uh, again, another huge honor to introduce our distinguished panelists, uh, both of whom will be at the fulcrum of meeting respectively the ambitious climate commitments in the United States uh, and the European Union. Uh, Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm uh, was sworn in as the 16th Secretary of Energy on February 20th, 2021. Uh, prior to her nomination as Secretary of Energy, among other things, she served two terms as Governor of Michigan. Uh, and during, during that tenure, then Governor Granholm emphasized new clean technologies and the jobs that they will create. Uh, Kadri Simpson uh, is the European Commissioner for Energy and was appointed in 2019. Uh, and prior to that, uh, starting in 2016, uh, she was Estonia's Minister for Economic Affairs and Infrastructure and had an extended career in Estonian politics uh, prior to that time. Uh, thank you both uh, for joining us uh, for this discussion today on how the United States and European Union can lead together uh, on climate action. Uh, and this conversation has, has never been more timely uh, than it is now. And to those joining us today, you can follow the conversation by using the hashtag capital letters EUFF2021.
Madam Secretary, Madam Commissioner, you know, we are uh, witnessing unprecedented uh, momentum and climate commitments and actions in the United States and the European Union. Maybe at the beginning, it would make some sense if both of you uh, discussed your top, top priorities uh, in the near future, in the coming months, um, in these areas. Perhaps we can start with Secretary Granholm uh, and then go to Commissioner Simpson, and then maybe you'll be able to comment on each other's on what each other has said. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Morningstar, and welcome to everyone. I want to start by really congratulating the Atlantic Council and the delegation of the European Union for hosting an incredible event this week. And I'm so pleased to be on with Commissioner Simpson. It's such a pleasure to be sharing the virtual stage with you once again. So um, I guess it's fitting that we're starting off with this question because the last time Commissioner Simpson and I met, we were we were bearing witness in real time to unprecedented momentum, as you say, because President Biden's Global Leaders Summit on climate was a monumental week of international cooperation and a lot of bold new pledges on climate action. I'm so proud of the big pledge that America made, committing to a 50 to 52% reduction in emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. And that, of course, is right in line with the ambitious goals President Biden laid out in his very first weeks of office, which is 100% clean electricity by 2035 and net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we've got to go, go, go and, and use this momentum collectively to continue to raise both America and the globe's ambitions around climate action and clean energy deployment and and really to do so in a way that puts millions of people to work. I'm all about the jobs side. We need to lift up communities that have been knocked down. We, and we would need to do this in a way that guarantees our economic competitiveness as well for, for decades to come. And that absolutely means getting his, uh, the president's American jobs plan passed, which he has proposed, which calls for massive investments in clean energy research and development and deployment, very importantly. And that plan is something I think the whole world should be rooting for because America's clean energy future is about all of our clean energy futures uh, for, for far too long. I think, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that for far too long, the global climate conversation really has assumed that climate action is a zero sum with the economy and we all stand to gain from developing the latest and greatest in clean energy. And we have an interest in shared progress. So it's not zero sum from country to country and it's not zero sum from the environment or climate to the economy. We all can gain and we all can gain for economically by addressing this issue. We wanna all build net zero economies. We've gotta create new jobs and businesses for our people. We all want to make good on our moral debts to those who have been bearing the burdens of fossil fuel pollution. And, and we can do it. We can do all of it if we pair our fierce competition with constructive international cooperation. And that's why forums like this are so important. So we have similar dreams, similar challenges. Let's work on them together. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Now I'll turn uh, to Commissioner Simpson. It's uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, and uh, uh, if you could uh, maybe tell us what some of your priorities are. Good afternoon from Brussels. Um, dear Secretary Granholm, dear Ambassador Morningstar, dear viewers. Uh, well, it is a real pleasure to have this discussion at the um, EU-US uh, Future Forum. Um, as we celebrate seven decades of successful cooperation between the EU and United States, and I am a true believer in a strong transatlantic relationship. So I'm convinced that uh, by working together, uh, we will drive the change needed uh, in the energy sector on both sides of Atlantic and all over the globe. So it is um, a pivotal, exciting time for energy and climate policy. And as uh, Secretary Granholm already mentioned two weeks ago, uh, President Biden's uh, leaders summit was a turning point for the US. And for and also for global commitment. 
Uh, here in Europe, we have just agreed on a groundbreaking climate law, and we will present shortly uh, major legislative changes to deliver our emission targets. So, um, at the same time, we know that uh, that COP uh, twenty six is also on the um, horizon, and. Um, as you know, our commitment is to become the first uh, climate neutral continent by 2050 and, uh, and um, already reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. And, and uh, last year, we set out our vision for reaching these targets. Um, in the energy sector, there were different strategic documents on hydrogen and methane and energy system integration and offshore energy uh, and also wave of renovation of uh, European buildings. Um, but uh, but now the green transition is also at the center of our long-term budget and at the heart of our recovery plan. And uh, and we do have a pretty significant firepower to finance it. Uh, but uh, but we have to keep in mind that we need also lots of um, uh, private investments because um, the investment challenge is um, around uh, 350 billion euros per year over this decade. Um, but we do have vision and uh, we do have strategic plans and um, we, we do have resources. So our priority this year is to add the last essential piece. And this is a wide ranging set of uh, legislative uh, um, changes to make sure that all sectors of economy uh, will contribute to the decarbonization agenda. And, uh, and um, I, I truly believe that we will achieve this. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let me just ask you quickly uh, whether you have any reactions to what Secretary Granholm said, and then I'll ask Secretary Granholm the same question. Well, uh, I, I think that we are in the same page that, uh, that still um, majority of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, uh, from the way how we produce and consume energy. And in this uh, regard, we do have uh, common challenges, how to well uh, define uh, the um, hydrogen market that doesn't um, exist, how to well uh, create um, global standards and, uh, and uh, certificates so that we uh, know that it helps us to achieve our um, climate targets. And, uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, I can only echo that, uh, that there is a necessary cooperation um, ahead of us. And of course, um, together we can also um, um, create this uh, global market for, for the rest of the world. And, right. And, and Madam Secretary. Yep, together we are stronger. I so appreciate um, Commissioner Simpson's acknowledgement that the Global Leaders Climate Summit was a turning point, or at least um, a recognition that the community recognizes, the European community recognizes that the United States is back, that we are seriously committed to, um, to, to climate change abatement, that we want to be partners with you. And I will say too that we recognize that the past four years where we were out of this conversation leads us to enter this with humility. And we, we know that uh, so many of our allies have been working continuously on this and we want to learn from you as well as partner with you to solve these big problems. So we're excited about it. Great. Let me, let me ask you this, uh, Madam Secretary, you, you made reference, I think you were making reference to a just energy transition. And you know, to meet uh, the climate goals, it's also going to be important that it be done in, some, in a way that's acceptable to you know, wide sectors of the population, a feeling that it's been fair, equitable, and just. Uh, could, could you talk a little bit more about yeah. how you see a just energy transition and what it means? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can do this in our any of our... our countries without acknowledging that the people who brung us to the dance, meaning the people who have powered our respective countries, must be respected and brought to the future. So a just transition for them is a top priority for us in and of itself, in no small part because we know that the coal and the power plant workers who built this nation can really play a massive role in making 
America's and the world's clean energy future a reality. Their skills are needed. We need these workers. And I know many of you feel the same way about your own fossil fuel communities. So we're in the US, uh, the Biden administration, we are committed to advancing justice and equity alongside of our push for clean energy. We're following through on that commitment by by uh, bringing these communities to the table, by working with them on job creation strategies that are specific to their needs, to their challenges. During his first week in office, President Biden established a working group that's administered by the Department of Energy and that collaborates across a number of agencies on solutions for communities with the highest concentrations of coal dependent jobs. And through uh, this listening session and uh, we'll, that we'll continue throughout the year, we've released our first report from that effort. Um, and it was last month and that identified nearly $38 billion in existing federal funding that could be used to support uh, economic revitalization and job growth and training in these communities. So we're excited about that. We also, DOE alone, um, Department of Energy alone, announced more than $109 million for projects that will spark next generation industries that will support jobs for, for coal and oil and gas and power plant workers. And it's just the first of many investments to come. And the American Jobs Plan then followed up with the president's proposal, lays out the next critical investments that we should make in the short term the American Jobs Plan is going to create thousands of jobs for workers to clean up, for example, abandoned landmines or plug uh, leaking oil and gas wells right in their backyards, which are jobs that their skills already position them perfectly for. But the plan is also going to get to work on scaling up industries of the future, like hydrogen. I know Commissioner Simpson, Simpson mentioned that, like carbon capture, like you know, in our country, we haven't done a whole lot with geothermal, we should be, but those skill sets can be transferred to, to those kind of production of clean energy. Uh, these workers cannot just uh, participate in, but lead while helping America move uh, on decarbonization. And, and looking at the international cooperation opportunities here, I was I was personally thrilled to announce during our the climate summit that the US is joining this empowering people initiative, which is formed by my European and Canadian colleagues with, with an aim to launch at the uh, 12th clean energy ministerial in June. And commissioner Simpson and I are also co-chairing the US EU Energy Council and its working groups, which we can and should use as a forum to focus on these just transition issues, both for our fossil fuel communities with, within the US and Europe, but also for developing countries as they navigate the energy transition as well. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Um, Madam Commissioner, um, you, know, you face a lot of the same issues um, in several of your member states uh, that uh, uh, Secretary Granholm uh, talked about. Uh, how do you see the, your green recovery plan uh, and green transition uh, dealing with these issues? Well, indeed, uh, we know that um, clean energy transition will cut emissions and um, it will reduce pollution and improve our health. But from the very beginning, when our president, Ursula von der Leyen, presented the European Green Deal, she was very clear that uh, fighting climate change cannot come at the cost of the most vulnerable in our societies. And, and luckily, we know that uh, clean energy transition also uh, has a strong potential to create jobs and, uh, and to boost growth. And, uh, and according to our estimates, um, every billion euro of, of investment uh, in renewable hydrogen, for example, uh, will create 10,000 jobs along the supply chain. So similarly, solar power could create 400,000 new direct and indirect jobs along the entire industrial value chain um, during this decade. And for comparison, uh, the coal industry currently employs um, here in the European Union less than 200,000 people. So uh, overall, we estimate that um, coal and climate neutral will um, create um, almost um, 2 million jobs across the EU. And these will be high quality, future proof jobs. Um, and these will bring revenues to local communities. But of course, we have to take care that those jobs will, will be created in the regions where, um, well, 
right now people get uh, their incomes from mining activities. So we know that uh, such a radial transformation will inevitably have a disruptive effect uh, um, well, in those specific regions um, ranging from loss of economic activities to, the, to a change of uh, the way of life for entire communities. And that's why um, um, I'm well, while I'm, I'm convinced that climate neutrality will ultimately benefit all Europeans, it is also clear that uh, some people and some regions and some industries will need uh, support to, to create new opportunities. And, uh, and this is what we call a just transition. First time ever we have specific funds for those regions. So we promise um, not to leave anyone behind and, and there are a wide range of um, uh, financial instruments and also uh, ways how we can advise them to attract more investments and new uh, job opportunities to those regions. And for us, this is not only about our own uh, member states and own regions. Um, we care about uh, our close neighborhood too. And, and that's why we have launched also similar pro programs for our neighboring countries, close regions in Western Balkans, and in Ukraine, so that they can also um, um, accommodate the transition towards a climate neutral economy. And, and of course, um, we are also ready to work with the uh, International Energy Agency to develop uh, solutions for the regions uh, that are most affected. And, uh, and I am also very glad to see that the just transition is now also getting the international attention it deserves. COP26 will once again bring this into the spotlight. Thank you. And both of you have really emphasized the importance of jobs and jobs in sectors that will be that could be adversely affected by the transition, uh, which which would be so important. Another area I think that it'd be good to get into, you know, I think there's general agreement that if we're going to meet our climate goals, uh, there's going to have to be uh, a lot of technology innovation. Uh, both of you have mentioned hydrogen carbon capture came up earlier. There are other areas uh, that are gonna be uh, important. Maybe if you could talk a little bit on how you think that the US and the EU can best cooperate to move forward uh, in these new technology areas. There are some vehicles in place, the US EU Energy Council in Europe, they call it the EU US Energy Council in any event. Uh, and uh, one, one area, cooperation with the uh, private sector. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Simpson, I think you may have referred to that. That's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be important. Uh, uh, maybe if you could uh, both talk, uh, talk about how you think we can best cooperate. Maybe I'll start with the secretary and then go to you, Commissioner. Great, so, so a thousand percent, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And I know you're asking about new technologies, but I just wanna step back for one second to note that of course, the most cost-effective step we could take toward decarbonizing the economy is to decarbonize the power grid. And those, we have technologies in place to do it and we wanna deploy them. It would clear the path to decarbonizing other sectors like transportation and buildings if we did the power grid. But as for new technologies, we absolutely need massive investments to uh, that, so that we can deploy, deploy, deploy cheaper and more efficient renewable energy, as well as address the challenges that the grid faces today, um, particularly around transmission infrastructure and energy storage. Europe, we know, is already a global leader here. And in the US, we are uh, flooring the accelerator. I would say put my foot on the gas, but we want to uh, put our foot on the electric vehicle accelerator. Um, over the past few months, DOE and the Biden administration have announced these ambitious new goals to cut the cost of solar, for example, by 60% within the decade and deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore grid by uh, offshore wind by uh, 2030 and uh, expand and upgrade the grid. And if we work faster on these efforts, um, you know, it will just mean that we can also turn our attention in which we are doing simultaneously to these new technologies. And as we work on reinvigorating the US EU Energy Council, I see offshore wind in particular as an opportunity for more dynamic engagement, innovation, uh, 
is also key in energy storage, especially because that market is projected to increase fourfold by 2030. So um, since 2017, the Department of Energy has invested more than $1.2 billion in energy storage research and development, about $400 million a year. And we took a huge step forward in March as we announced the creation of our, what we call our grid storage launch pad. That is a $75 million research and uh, development facility that's gonna help us accelerate the deployment of long duration and low cost grid energy storage and expand battery R&D capabilities. Um, like the US, the EU is also pursuing innovation, obviously, and deployment in the energy storage space, which makes this another opportunity for possible engagement and cooperation under the um, US EU Energy Council. And it all goes back to what I was saying earlier about pairing competition with cooperation. If we work together here to prioritize more research and development and deployment of clean energy technologies, we can move more quickly to achieve our own net zero goals while accelerating the global transition and lowering the cost of decarbonization for the rest of the world. Everybody benefits. We all want to get to the solutions on hydrogen that's cost effective. We all want to get to the solutions on cost effective CCUS. Um, maybe it's blue hydrogen, maybe it's green hydrogen, maybe it's pink hydrogen, the next generation of, of nuclear technologies for those who are interested in that. The bottom line is there's so much to cooperate on in these advanced energy technologies. And I look forward to working with the EU on them. Well, that's great. And, and your enthusiasm is great as well. <laughs> and uh, um, Commissioner, there's a, a lot a lot that uh, the secretary said uh, that you may want to that you may want to respond to. I, I have to mention that, uh, you know, as to offshore wind, that's certainly important in your part of Europe, being from Estonia and the Baltic states, where so much wind is coming off of the Baltic Sea and offers a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe you could give your comments on cooperation, the private sector, and some of the areas that the secretary mentioned. Yes, indeed, uh, Ambassador Morningstar. Uh, from where I'm coming, we do have shallow coastal waters, and well, we, we see a based opportunity on offshore wind. Uh, but well, uh, we also see uh, that uh, climate change is a challenge uh, that no country and uh, no sector can solve alone. So uh, to create meaningful uh, global change, um, I actually see no alternative uh, to the good uh, working uh, relationship between European Union and United States. And, and in this regard, technology and innovation are, in my view, some of the most promising and, uh, and impactful areas for that cooperation. And uh, we share the vision that uh, breakthrough uh, clean solutions, they are needed um, to make the transition faster, but also they are needed uh, to make this transition cheaper and more capable of generating growth. And um, well, of course, our aim is to relaunch the EU, US Energy Council um, this year as soon as possible. Uh, we want to make it a dynamic setting where uh, business will be able to share their experience and network and develop new projects. And we have also proposed a new clean tech alliance with the United States that um, um, this idea is um, here um, that uh, this uh, Clean Tech Alliance would be to create lead markets and um, cooperate on clean technologies like uh, renewables and, uh, and also, again, clean hydrogen. And um, this would pave the way for investments um, um, to the benefit of uh, green companies on both sides of Atlantic. And we could create more opportunities for business and remove barriers and exchange knowledge. Um, and I'm very much looking forward um, to sharing some initial ideas with, uh, with um, uh, you in the format of the, of, of the dialogue. Um, but for, for global change, bilateral transatlantic cooperation uh, will again not be enough. And we need to work together across the globe to promote topics of uh, common interest. And uh, I'm very pleased to see uh, that you, Secretary Granholm, uh, you are a candidate for the position of the chair of the 2022 
uh, IEA in this area, along with the nominations of uh, vice chairs for Denmark and Belgium. And this would be a dream team in the making. And we also warmly welcome the US offer to host uh, the 2022 annual meetings um, of both the Clean Energy and uh, Mission Innovation Ministerials. So uh, having the US at the steering wheel of those important multilateral um, fora will help to keep the, keep the momentum on raising clean tech ambitions all over the world. Great. I see the, the clock is ticking down. Um, and uh, uh, so why don't we do this? Uh, why don't I ask each of you uh, if you have any closing comments, any further closing comments uh, that you would like to make uh, before we uh, uh, before we sign off, uh, you know, uh, Secretary and then Commissioner. Yeah, let's just briefly, I mean, I just want to say the United States can learn from the EU's approach to encouraging greater global policy action through both these targeted pro programs and funding to drive down costs for leap frogging this clean energy technology together we can do this we can start with a focus on our existing forums that you have described the clean energy ministerial and mission innovation to make this approach to clean energy collaboration more coherent and more consolidated and therefore more effective so i say let's do this i can't wait we are more powerful together and i look forward to working with you that's great madam commissioner well, also, also from our side, um, well, uh, I, I only can uh, agree on, uh, on the need for, um, for cooperation. And, uh, and um, I do know that there are new technological solutions um, where um, um, interest is uh, growing globally. And uh, we are very interested in working closely with the United States. And uh, as part of the um, Green Tech Alliance uh, with the United States, we could develop um, joint research programs and uh, and also uh, we have to work closely to uh, to create a well functioning international hydrogen market so um, lots of work ahead of us well thank you commissioner and and thanks to both of you commissioner uh, simpson uh, and uh, secretary secretary granholm um, you both were exceptional speakers uh, and these dialogues with the two of you are so important because it's the two of you that will be driving much of the process uh, over the next few years. So that's really great. I also want to thank uh, our audience for joining the session and the EU delegation uh, for partnering uh, with the Atlantic Council uh, with respect uh, to the forum. I hope all of you in the audience will uh, continue tuning in for the EU-US Future Forum programming, and you can find the full agenda uh, on the Atlantic Council website. And this has worked out perfectly because there is a giant clock in front of me and we have 11 <laughs> seconds left. So uh, so th thank you very much. And uh, we'll turn it back to the overall moderators. Thank you. The world faces a host of big challenges. How do space agencies help address some of these problems? Space-based activities have never been more essential to addressing societal challenges. The capabilities enabled by space that underlie our daily lives are very well known, from day-to-day -day activities such as urban planning, resource management, global communications, and weather forecasting, to fostering new discoveries and expanding human knowledge of our universe and our home planet. Less well known perhaps is how space contributes to other priorities, driving aerospace technology and innovation, supporting a strong industrial base to drive economic growth and productivity, addressing societal challenges and providing leadership and, and inspiration, especially to young people uh, to study uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. At our 20 uh, centers and facilities across the country and the only national laboratory in space, NASA studies the Earth, including the climate, our sun, and our solar system, and we conduct research testing and technology development for both space and aeronautics. 
and we share what we learn, making all of our scientific data, including Earth observations and measurements of the ocean, land, ice, and atmosphere, freely and openly available so that policymakers have the critical information they need from which uh, mitigation strategies and solutions can be developed. And it's also part of our culture to spin off our technologies. We find homes for our technology beyond NASA. We transfer it to commercial companies and partner with them to help bring their innovations to market. And these spin-offs result in products that improve and even save lives every day. Most of us know that the video cameras on our phones come from space technology. Few, few know that the high pressure ventilator developed in 37 days by NASA engineers to treat uh, COVID-19 patients have been turned over to companies not only in the United States, but throughout the world to manufacture and freely use. Uh, so space agencies tackle significant societal cha challenges every day, uh, not only at home, but around the world. How important is international collaboration to NASA's mission and cooperation with Europe more specifically? This is an easy question for me, having spent much of my career cultivating international partnerships for NASA. I've always worked especially closely with the European Space Agency and national European partners, both from Washington and as NASA's resident liaison in Europe. Since NASA's founding, we've concluded literally thousands of agreements with 120 nations for cooperation in every one of our mission areas. These international partnerships have continued to grow in both diversity and importance. And today we're clearly in a new age of space development and we're partnering more than ever with both commercial and international partners. However, our collaboration with Europe has long been part of our close transatlantic relationship dating back many decades. Believe it or not, the first flight of a non-American on the U.S. space shuttle was from Germany nearly 40 years ago when Europe provided the Space Lab Scientific Laboratory carried in the shuttle bay. Now close to half of all of our active international agreements are with European entities, the European Space Agency, national partners in Europe, such as Germany, Italy, France, and many more. This past year, we celebrated a huge milestone with 20 years of permanent human presence aboard the International Space Station. And just a couple of weeks ago, we welcomed Thomas Pesquet to the ISS, the first of three consecutive flights for European crew members this year. We look forward to wel welcoming Matthias Maurer on the next mission and then Samantha Cristoforetti. And our joint scientific collaborations have also made the history books from the Hubble Space Telescope to the Cassini-Huygens um, exploration of Saturn. And now we turn our sights to the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope and to together returning to Earth the first samples from Martian soil. In every aspect of exploration, human and robotic, we are accomplishing so much together. With the U.S. rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, there is now transatlantic policy alignment on combating climate change. What is the role of space agencies? Space is an exceptionally important asset for addressing climate change. Space agencies are enablers for understanding the issues and developing solutions to the challenges. NASA has more than 20 Earth observation missions in orbit and others in formulation and programs to build capacity around the world for using space-based data for societal benefit. In partnership with the Agency for International Development, our SEVER program works in partnership with leading regional consortia to help developing countries use information provided by Earth observing satellites and geospatial technologies to manage climate risks and land use. We're empowering decision makers with tools, products, and services to act locally on climate sensitive issues. Servir is helping people in Africa, the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, the lower Mekong, and Central and South America to manage challenges in food security, water resources, land use change, and natural disasters. So with activities in more than 45 countries and counting, Servir has already developed over 70 customized tools and collaborated with over 500 institutions to improve capacity for developing lo local solutions. 
but better known, of course, are our Earth observing satellites from Europe, the United States, and elsewhere, observing key climate indicators so we can better understand how the Earth operates as a system, an integrated system, from the oceans to the atmosphere. Space agencies provide the tools and the scientific data to enable scientists to perform the analysis and modeling that then informs policy decisions. And of course, the second A in NASA is aeronautics, and we frequently collaborate with partners in Europe, such as Germany and France, in aeronautics research. NASA is expanding climate change research for sustainable aviation by developing and testing new green technologies for next generation aircraft, new automation tools for greener airspace operations, and sustainable energy operations for aircraft propulsion. And between NASA and the European Space Agency, we're in active strategic discussions on how to expand already robust cooperation to include even greater efforts to combat climate change. NASA has announced it will be returning to the moon with the Artemis program. What is Europe's role in this effort? The strong transatlantic relationship between the United States and Europe in space will be carried into the next era of human exploration to the moon and Mars. Through the Artemis program, NASA is going to land the first woman and next man on the moon to explore more of the lunar surface than ever before. We will collaborate with our international and commercial partners and establish sustainable exploration by the end of the decade. And then we will use what we learn on and around the moon to take the next giant leap, sending humans to Mars. Europe's going to have an absolutely central role in the Artemis program with key contributions for the program's success. Europe is providing critical elements such as habitation, communications, and refueling for the new gateway that will orbit around the moon, the European service modules for the Orion spacecraft in which our astronauts will travel to cislunar space on the SLS rocket, and these in future lunar surface cooperation will be a key part of our program. And it's, of course, essential that the United States and Europe work together to preserve the orbital environment and that the future of space be peaceful, free of conflict, and one where humanity explores and develops the moon and Mars in harmony. The United States and its Artemis international partners will follow fundamental principles to ensure safety and responsible behavior in outer space. The Artemis Accords, signed by nine countries so far, articulate a series of principles to ensure that all activities conducted under the Artemis program are implemented in a manner that fully complies with the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and other agreements, as well as beneficial practices such as the full, free, timely, and public release of scientific data. Many additional nations have expressed interest in joining the Artemis program and signing the Artemis Accords, and two European nations, Italy and Luxembourg, were among the eight original signatories. The Artemis Accords are a beginning, not an ending, and will inform future multilateral discussions at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and in other international forums. We're looking forward to many more European nations signing on to these important principles and to our collaborations in space that will write the next chapter in the history of space exploration. Thank you, Karen. It's exciting to see that the spirit of transatlantic cooperation transcends even the Earth's atmosphere. The Hubble Space Telescope is pretty awe-inspiring, and even more so knowing that it's made possible by cooperation between NASA and the European Space Agency. And I'll just say that personally, I am eagerly awaiting the future Artemis mission, putting the next woman and next man on the moon. Sustainable lunar exploration established by the end of the decade and then sending human beings to Mars, that's the exact kind of ambition and transformative thinking that the transatlantic community can achieve together among the stars and right here on planet Earth. In the previous dialogue, we heard from Secretary Granholm and Commissioner Simpson that the EU and the US are seizing the opportunity to align strategies and practical steps forward in managing the climate crisis. Proactive leadership and multilateral coordination will be essential in facing one of the greatest global challenges, one that transcends borders. 
The green transition will feature prominently as the European Union and the United States build a post-pandemic recovery agenda together. But there are many areas of cooperation to cover here at the forum. To highlight one such area that requires active engagement among allies and partners, I'll turn to Julia Friedlander, C. Boyd and Gray Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center to introduce our next distinguished guest. Over to you, Julia. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure today to welcome Senator Reich of, of Idaho to the EU Future Forum to talk about a very important piece of legislation that is working its way through the US Senate, the Strategic Competition Act. Senator, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. This is a wide ranging bill covering US strategy and economics and politics and military. I was wondering if you might be able to highlight some of the high points of it and what you prioritized. Sure. Uh, first of all, we ought to set the table and talk about uh, how important this is. Uh, uh, look, China is the biggest foreign policy issue for the United States, for the European Union, and in, indeed for the planet. Uh, what's been happening uh, with China in recent decades uh, certainly uh, indicates that they're moving very quickly uh, to uh, uh, center stage uh, uh, on the world stage. And uh, uh, look, uh, competition's good always, so long as it's fair and so long as the uh, playing field is level. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, I've been working on this bill for some time. And certainly I've, it's, it hasn't been alone. It's been bipartisan. I've had a lot of help on it. When it came out of committee recently, it was on a 20, uh, 21 to one vote. So that tells you how, uh, how, how broad the support is for this. Uh, the bill does, uh, it does five uh, big things. Uh, it counters uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party political influence in the U.S., including, uh, and importantly, universities. It established initi initiatives with allies and partners uh, on tech, uh, defense, and other issues. It allocates more funding to counter the uh, uh, Chinese infrastructure uh, projects. It sanctions uh, Chinese Communist Party officials for human rights abuses in Xinjiang, and it counters, uh, very importantly, counters Chinese unfair trading practices like IP theft. Uh, they have used that to leverage their position in the world. Uh, they argue that uh, they they don't have the same experience and history we have with part with uh, rule of law with patents and, uh, and international norms. I frankly don't buy that issue. Uh, and uh, we, we've got to get this part of it right, or it's going to be a very long 21st century uh, for, um, uh, for the world, really. And uh, I'm hoping to move this as a standalone bill in the Senate, uh, not attaching other bills to it, but we'll see. Uh, probably going to move it forward before too long. Thank you. And you mentioned that one of your key priorities there is countering the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. How do you think that that will go forward, especially um, within the U.S. Pol political framework, but also working with our close democratic allies? Well, th this is a uh, th this is a bipartisan issue, and it's also uh, a, a, a by country issue. Uh, the what, what the Communist Party. Uh, does is they use money, threats, and intimidation and disinformation to undermine our open societies. Both the U.S. and Europe have felt the impact of this. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, over 100 uh, U.S. universities accepted approximately $425 million in gifts from China. Well, these gifts aren't made because the Chinese uh, feel warm and fuzzy about a particular a university, they're, they're meant to uh, buy influence and to tamp down criticism of, of the way they work. Uh, we need uh, to do more about this. This influence erodes free speech and debate. It compromises technology and innovation and coerces countries into accepting the uh, Chinese Communist Party's line. U.S. and Europe should be working together on this issue. That's the first chapter in a committee report I wrote last year uh, on this. Uh, this, uh, if, if anybody who hasn't gotten this, you can get it from the uh, uh, from the committee in the Senate. 
And it really is a comprehensive work that I did as chairman of the committee and on behalf of the committee. It talks about not just our universities, but also uh, uh, businesses, media, and even government, including state and local governments. So the Chinese Communist Party can't be allowed to do this. We must protect our democracy and build resiliency over the malign political influence from authoritarian actors. And Senator, I was just about to ask you about the report that you flashed uh, on the screen there. Um, what you know, it's a, it's a it's a it's a wonderful piece, and I encourage everyone to to, to take a look at it. It's, it's very comprehensive. Um, what are the next steps that the U.S. and Europe really need to take, particularly in the economic sphere, to counter what you say uh, uh, unfair economic trade practices, or um, you know, increasingly um, supply chain issues, especially with regards to Xinjiang. Well, the report that you just mentioned was focused uh, on our uh, the United States relationship with Europe and the importance of us working together. Look, we are we 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 have irritants between us, but overall, we are very much the same when it comes to our our culture, our freedoms, our uh, uh, our rule of law, our adherence to international norms. And it's it's important that we come together to do that. So we we need to remember that if you put uh, the U.S. together with Europe. Uh, at a little over 300 million each, we still don't make up one half of the population of China. Having said that, we have tremendous influence because of the decades and indeed centuries uh, we have uh, uh, done uh, the work building the rule of law and international norms where we can all operate freely under a free market system and uh, uh, do it uh, uh, with uh, uh, under the rule of law. Uh, but the first thing we need to do, of course, is is uh, try to get rid of these long-standing irritants, I call them, that we have, like the Boeing Airbus issue is a good start, and uh, digital taxation, dueling privacy regulations. Th these are all important, but all of them pale uh, in comparison to the influence that uh, the China is uh, is attempting to exert over the international stage. And we, we'll do a lot better cooperating uh, that rather than punishing each other for what are really small irritants compared to the overall issue that we have with China. Uh, if we leverage uh, our combined markets, speak in a unified voice, uh, we can push back against unfair economic practices, expand our trade and investment. The EU and several European countries are getting more involved in the Indo-Pacific and, in, and in Africa. And it's important that the US and Europe coordinate uh, those uh, on, those, uh, on those continents because we'll, we'll do a lot better together. Couldn't agree more at the Atlanta Council, and certainly that is one of the main goals of the EU Future Forum. Um, you know, the Biden administration is quick out the gate with executive orders um, and with a stated goal of putting together a, a new strategic strategy on China. Um, how do you assess its scorecard so far? Right, you know, just after the hundred day mark. Well, I think I think the jury's still out. You know, a hundred days. Uh, everybody always jumps up and down about that, but it's. Uh, it's an arbitrary number, and uh, uh, you, you like to see a whole lot of progress, but um, I, I, I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, first of all, we are on the same page on some things, like human rights in China. I'm pleased that the Biden team has uh, sanctioned the Chinese officials over Hong Kong and, and uh, Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang. But um, uh, look, I, I, we really need to work on the IP theft and the unfair trade practices. I mean, there's a uh, that's it. That that is so important to uh, all of us, to every country on the planet. Um, uh, China just does things differently than we do. They don't adhere to international norms. And uh, I, my wife and I, had the opportunity to travel in China in 1983. And uh, when we left there, I, you know, I said, well, you know, this this isn't going anywhere. My gosh, in in just uh, in in a handful of decades, they have come centuries. They did it the old-fashioned way. They stole the, every good idea we have, except our freedoms, uh, our democracy, uh, uh, and our uh, our economic system of a free market, a free enterprise system, uh, taking socialism as opposed uh, to uh, the capitalist. And uh, they have worked it to the point where they are moving very quickly. And that's got it. We've got to push back against that. Um, uh, the administration's got to be careful. Uh, when pushing cooperation with China, the, the Communist Party always tries to get us to sacrifice some of the freedoms that we have in exchange for cooperation and that, that sort of thing. So this has got to be done very carefully. 
I'm, I'm committed to work with the uh, uh, Biden administration with this. This is not a, a partisan issue in the United States any more than it is an issue between, uh, a difference of issue between the United States and Europe. We've got to work together. Thank you. Um, and as a key transatlantic voice, um, I'd just like to ask, you know, what is your main message when you speak to parliamentary counterparts or with governments or in uh, messaging to general public about transatlantic cooperation on China? Um, what are the key key elements there? Especially, I mean, I would say especially when some governments will say a confrontational approach to China may not be in our own national security interest. Well, I think first of all, first and foremost, uh, we're stronger together than we are apart. And um, we, we are, uh, we've gotten used to doing things apart rather than together uh, because we haven't, we haven't really had the kind of challenge that the, the China, uh, that China presents to us. As I said, we've, we've argued over uh, minuscule things uh, when you're talking about in comparison to the uh, challenge that uh, we're getting uh, from China. Um, we built, we, uh, the United States and Europe, uh, with, with some others involved, have built the kind of enterprise that we have in the world. And it's worked really, really well. Uh, it's built on free enterprise. It's built on a free market system. It's built on democracies. And uh, the Chinese aren't used to doing this sort of thing. Uh, they're they're uh, putting one foot in front of the other, following the kind of things, uh, the, the, the way they do business they're in a strong authoritarian country that is not dependent upon a... Uh, a, a robust, free, democratic uh, population uh, that that can bring the kind of influence that's needed uh, when we're talking about uh, this sort of thing. So, uh, my main message is we're stronger together. Uh, not only are, are we stronger together, we need to focus on the fact that we're very much the same when it comes to human rights, when it comes to to the uh, uh, international norms. And uh, we, we don't recognize this sometimes, and it's, it's important that we join together as we go through this 21st century and bring China along, uh, requiring them to, uh, to uh, engage in the kind of international norms that, uh, that we have used to build the free market structure that is, uh, that is the world today. Yeah, no, absolutely, and we couldn't we couldn't agree more here, um, specifically on the like-minded shared values um, and also shared capabilities in a lot of ways. But you know, you you highlight we have to get beyond um, uh, some of the immediate hurdles in the transatlantic relationship. Boeing, Airbus uh, being one of them. We're very happy to see that that's at least on pause through July. Um, but you know, the EU is a complicated beast, and I think we're, we highlight this right. There are differences of opinion within the Commission, with, between the Commission and the Parliament. Um, but also among member states. So, you know, it's it's complicated for us Americans sometimes to speak to Europe. How do you think we can, you know, try to develop consensus more effectively given those differences? Well, you know, <laughs> I serve in the United States Congress. I know about differences <laughs> and uh, differences from state to state, from party uh, from party to party, from individual to individual. Um, uh, I, I think the the uh, what, what we always have to come back to is that uh, is that we're a lot more the same than we are different, and uh, and we need to prioritize what we want to do, and prioritize big problems versus uh, squabbles. And uh, look, people that are free people have a tendency to squabble. Nobody ever said it was pretty, or nobody ever said it was uh, fun to do. But uh, they, these have got to get resolved. And I and I think that. Uh, uh, things like this COVID-19 issue that we've all experienced have brought the U.S. and, and Europe closer together, uh, particularly as the Chinese have pushed back, refusing to take any responsibility for this. In fact, even attempting to foist off responsibility on, on the West, which is which we all know is ludicrous. Um, we, we've set up dialogues uh, on China and, uh, and taken action on it. We need to continue to do that. And, and we've got to sustain, uh, we, we can't, this isn't a thing where you just run out and do something and say, there, it's fixed. No, it isn't fixed. It's going to be, a, this is going to be a long-term uh, issue over the uh, next, uh, over, or the, over the rest of the 21st century and beyond probably. And we need to get uh, a, uh, a protocol in place for how we work together to push back on what's a very big market 
And, and a market that uh, wants to do business different than what we've been doing business really for centuries. Thank you so much. And Senator Mish, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today for taking part on the EU Future Forum as a transatlanticist. Um, we thank you all, all the more um, and we look forward to seeing uh, your leadership in the coming years and uh, on this issue. So thanks again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. And I, look, I, I meet with our European friends regularly in Washington, D.C., whether it's ambassadors, whether it's uh, uh, ministers, and and we talk about this issue all the time. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, th this is a, th our, our relationship with Europe is good. I know our European friends sometimes wring their hands about it because people here make statements that uh, in a free society anybody can make. But look, we are much, much closer to our European cousins than we are uh, anyone else in the world. We need to make this work. It'll, uh, it'll do good things uh, for, for both of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Rich. Thank you, Julia. Managing the relationship with China will be a key priority for the US and the EU. Close coordination and open dialogue, even on areas of transatlantic policy divergence, will be key to managing the complex and overlapping partnerships and competitions with China. Our speakers today have highlighted that close coordination and dialogue across sectors and industries the EU-US relationship has many facets and maintaining open and frequent lines of communication only makes this partnership stronger. And with the diversity of perspectives and experiences that make up the EU and the US, that's a lot of communication. Even at the forum, the breadth and depth of the relationship is on vivid display. Over the three days of programming, we'll feature speakers from 18 of the EU member states, as well as Americans from across the country. Now, let's turn to key voices from two of those member states as they share their own experiences as EU members. We'll start with The View from Athens, featuring Greek Foreign Minister Nikos Dendias, moderated by Europe Center, Senior Fellow Demir Marusic. We'll turn then to Warsaw for a dialogue on transatlantic recovery and engagement with Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, moderated by Ian Brzezinski. But first, over to Demir. Hello, and welcome, everyone. I'm Demir Marusic, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all for joining us today at the EU US Future Forum. Many thanks to my colleagues at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and the delegation of the European Union to the United States for partnering with us on this three-day conference. It's really an impressive operation back here. Before we begin, I want to encourage our audience out there uh, to engage us on social media using the hashtag EUFF2021. That's hashtag EUFF2021. I'm honored to host this session. Uh, it's titled In Dialogue, The View from Athens, um, I'm joined by my guest, His Excellency uh, Nikos Dendias, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Hellenic Republic. Uh, there's much to talk about and time is short, uh, so let's begin. Mr. Minister, welcome. Um, thank you for hosting uh, me. I wanted to ask, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, a general opening question. Uh, the US-Greek relationship uh, has been undergoing a renaissance. Um, one might set the uh, moment where uh, the Renaissance began, I think, uh, in the second Obama term. But uh, despite political changes uh, in the United States uh, and a change of administration in Athens, uh, the relationship has only uh, gone from strength to strength, I would say. Um, with the new Biden administration in office, in office, Mr. Minister, could I ask you to outline uh, for us uh, here in the United States uh, what you'd like to see uh, from Washington in the coming years? What is working well, um, and uh, where could we uh, work better together? Well, thank you for the question. It's something that is very interesting from our side as well uh, to look at and, and also to take account of what has been achieved and also to look forward what we can do more, what we can do better. As a, uh, as a comment to start with, I would say that these relations, the Greek-US relations, are built on a very solid foundation of common values, which sounds like a stereotype, but it is not. It is not. And if you'll allow me to say, in our region, it is rather something that's in, in demand. Have a common understanding of the world order, 
of the rule of law, of democracy, of human rights, of common values, have a common understanding of how we would like the world to move forward. We have a very good relation. We had a very good relation with the, as a country with the Obama administration. We had a very good relation with the Trump administration. And we're having a very good relation with the Biden administration. We have signed a defense agreement with the Trump administration. Secretary Pompeo was in Athens in October 2019. And we're negotiating a revised uh, uh, MDCA with the Biden administration. Now, your, your basic question, your fundamental question is what Greece wants more from the United States? The answer is we would like to have more American presence in the region. This is a very turbulent region. And I have to say that when the United States leave a vacuum, other powers, which do not necessarily have the same understanding on the world order, on human rights, on democracy, try to fill the gap. So we would like, and the area needs more of the United States, not less. Um, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh Let's talk about uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, because I think that's uh, one area uh, that there is uh, there's much room for uh, for increased cooperation. Um, you had a contentious press conference with your uh, Turkish counterpart the other week. Um, it's the latest flare up in a <laughs> in a in a relationship uh, a little, that is. Uh, not, let's call it not usual. <laughs> Okay, not usual. Fair enough. Um, the, Uni the European Union has, uh, uh, I think, uh, stood, spoken in one voice, I think, in the in, uh, and developing a strategy for the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, apart from being more present, could you talk a little bit more about what you would see as uh, uh, you'd like to see the United States do uh, strategically in the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, uh, I have to say that the United States is in a unique position because the United States is an ally of Greece and the United States is also an ally of Turkey. And both countries are member of NATO and the United States is the leading force in NATO, has been, is, will be. So the United States have a very strong relation with both allies, both Greece and Turkey. The problem here with the, with the Turkish side is that unfortunately, Turkey slowly, but I have to say, obviously deviates from the, uh, the world example that the United States really projects, which means rule of law, human rights, democracy, and also participation in a rule-based international order. Most, for example, of our differences with Turkey will be very easily resolved if Turkey would subscribe to the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea or at least if Turkey would accept the, you know, the, Euro, uh, the UN the UNCLOS as the standard terms of references for resolving the limitations in sea zones. And the United States, which supports exactly the same ideas, for example, in the Pacific Ocean versus what China is claiming against the Philippines, would be the ideal partner that will help persuade Turkey that this corresponds to a better future for Turkey, a more stable future for our region, and also a much better United States-Turkish relations. But there are numerous examples. The United States have a lot of leverage in the region, and it's the only power that easily communicates with almost all the sides, and, also, and is the power that can help enhance the relation between the parties in the region. Having said that, the European Union has also to play a role. But for the European Union, one thing has to be understandable. The European Union is a big power economically. It has also to be a big power geopolitically. Hmm. If I can ask you a question then, uh, not directly related to it, but um, uh, on Cyprus, uh, it was uh, uh, surprising, at least to me, that uh, the uh, Geneva talks uh, went nowhere um, and that now there's talk of uh, coming from the Turkish side from a, a, about a two-state solution. Um, I, you know, perhaps you, you, you have nothing more to tell us here, but it, can you tell us, is, is there any hope? Uh, you were at the meetings. Um, there's, uh, the UN is talking about having another, another set of meetings in the next couple of weeks. Um, should we, are there any signs of optimism? Well, it's easy not to be optimistic. I have to say even myself, which have been a, a, always advocating for optimism, uh, I can understand somebody who, after 
observing three days in a basement in Geneva with no result at all can say that well, there's no hope. But And also the Cyprus issue is a perfect example of, on what I was speaking about before, that Turkey ha has to understand that in order to resolve the differences in our region, rules, the rules-based society in international order has to apply. Because in Cyprus, what is the difference? The ones, let's call it the one side, says that we have to try to find the solution within the framework of international law and the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Whether the other side, Turkey, the Turkish Cypriots, say that no, there's no reason to do that. There's just two-state solution, which have been imposed by the Turkish troops back in 1974. So we have to discuss on the basis of what has been achieved after the intervention or the invasion of Turkey in Cyprus in 1974. So one side advocates for a rule of law, the other side ad advocates for the fait accompli. Now, but yet again, so starting from these two so different points, it's very difficult to be optimistic. But yet again, yet again, I have to say that we should continue trying. And I would like to thank the Secretary General of the United States and uh, the United Nations for doing exactly that trying and trying and trying and trying. I believe that reason is the ultimate force in the universe. And if reason prevails, Turkey would understand and Turkish Cypriots would understand that the solution on this, of the Cyprus issue, according to the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, according to international law, is to the best interest of the Turkish Cypriots and to the best interest of Turkey. But having said that, it is not easy at all. It is not easy at all. We have to try a lot. Um, let's uh, then just now uh, rotate a little bit um, and talk about the Western Balkans, uh, which is a, a region uh, very close to my heart personally, uh, but I know also very important to Greece. Um, you recently met with the new uh, Montenegrin foreign minister uh, in Athens, and uh, you expressed very strong support for continued European enlargement. Um, but let me be very blunt. Uh, the plausibility of enlargement, I think, uh, over the last few years has... Uh, uh, has increasingly rung hollow across the region. And uh, with the pandemic um, and the, uh, I would say, quite uh, clever vaccine diplomacy being uh, leveraged by the Chinese and the Russians and uh, the West being kind of slow to respond to that, um, I'm concerned that the idea itself of, of uh, you know, Europe, a, a broader Europe is, uh, is taking a beating. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the Biden team is now uh, getting together its, uh, its, its team to, to work on the Balkans. Um, what, can, what can we all do together uh, to restore the momentum of the European promise uh, from, uh, that was established in Thessaloniki uh, 20 years ago at this point? Yes. Well, thank you for appreciating that for, for, for my country, for Greece, but also but for all committed Europeans, Western Balkans is a target a target to be included in this European success story. We cannot allow a black hole to remain in the center of Europe. Now, I will give you that it is not going very fast. I will give you that there are many difficulties. Also, the, your, your expression, it took a beating. It's, it's, it's more than accurate. You're absolutely right. But I have to say, in my humble opinion, I see the European paradigm, the European experience, the European experiment, if you want me to say so, has the monotheistic religions with the exception of Islam. They need at least 300 years to take root. That's what happened to Christianity. Now, the European Union is much younger than that. Doesn't, it's not even a century from where we started this huge trip towards unification of Europe. It will take time. But that does not mean that we will not have to try and we will not have to continue our efforts towards persuading our Western Balkan neighbors to go to accept the criteria of the European Union and also to live according to these criteria, the European acquis. Again, these countries do have problems, but Greece can present them with a know-how that could help them towards the European journey, journey. And I have to say also the European Union has to appreciate that historically speaking, within a historical dimension of things, Europe cannot progress with a black hole in the Western Balkans. That is not achievable. So it may take time, it may take effort, but is, it is something that in my humble opinion needs to happen and will happen. 
Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit uh, to questions about the economy. Um, it's hard to uh, miss the fact that now, um, you know, even though your your foreign minister, climate change is is foreign policy. It's becoming uh, central um, to thinking about uh, about international relations. Um, the EU's post COVID recovery plan uh, is heavily geared towards green technology. Uh, the, Bi the Biden administration has also made no secret of uh, uh, of prioritizing green goals. Um, and your government as well has uh, recently unveiled a, a very ambitious uh, development program and investment program uh, for for Greece. Um, can you talk a little bit about the opportunities there? Uh, you know, if you'd like to talk about also opportunities for the broader region around you, how do you see uh, green priorities shaping uh, development and uh, integration? Well, first of all, let me talk about my own country, Greece, and my own my own government, the Mitsotakis government in Greece. Well, we are, as you know, we're a conservative government. And yet again, we consider ourselves a green government. We have made huge steps. Uh, we have taken the decision, for example, to delignitize our economy up to 2030. May I be allowed to tell you that up to now, lignite was the main source for producing electricity in Greece. And yet again, as it is not environmental friendly, we said, no, we will go to the green energy. But also we have taken bold decisions in trying to protect our environment protect our forests, protect our shores, protect our nature. Having said that, we see ourselves as a hub for energy interconnectivity. Pipelines, but also electricity interconnectors from Africa and also from Israel, from uh, 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 Cyprus, is something that is within the program of the Mitsotakis government. And also we are advancing the use of natural gas as the, inter the, the interim step from the current level of the economy, the energy consuming economy towards the green, the green economy of the future. And we're trying to connect ourselves with the Balkans in order to provide them with a choice of source of energy. Because up to now, the whole of the Balkans could only get energy from Russia. That was that. Now, with Alexandropolis and with other installations in Greece, we give them a choice. They can choose. And by choosing, they can get a better price. And by getting a better price, for their energy, they can easily create more growth for their economies. So we consider ourselves as an exemplary green economy in the making, but also as a hub for energy in the Balkans and the overall region. Finally, uh, Mr. Minister, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about China. Um, I think there's an ongoing debate uh, about how to approach China, and I think it's uh, maybe a bit of a caricature to say uh, that it's a uh, strict dichotomy between seeing it either as a, uh, a peer competitor or a dangerous adversary. Um, it's a little oversimplified, but you see people talk about it that way. Uh, Europe's comprehensive agreement on investment um, seems to be in limbo right now. Uh, and it seems to be maybe nudging the balance of how uh, we uh, across the West are, are talking about it in, in terms of thinking about China as an adversary. In Greece, uh, how do you see this dynamic uh, evolving, especially given uh, the importance of Chinese investments in, in Greek infrastructure? Um, and what should the West, uh, very broadly speaking, Europe uh, and the United States, um, be doing to compete better with China going forward? Well, first of all, thank you for using a, a, an important Greek word on, on, on your question, dichotomy. dichotomy means cutting things into two pieces. Uh, that's what it means in Greek. Uh, and it's coming from ancient Greek. But unfortunately, in, in, in the world, we cannot do it. Uh, we cannot cut the globe into two and leave a path for China and us remain in the rest. There's, there's one globe, one world. And for this to function, we need a much more complicated approach than just see China as a diehard adversary. Uh, having said that also, I have to mention that China was brave enough to invest in Greece during the years of crisis where our European partners and friends didn't take the risk. China took the risk to invest in the port of Paris, and we appreciate what China has done. But yet again, a two-track approach is needed. On the one hand, China is a part of the world economy, a very useful part of the world economy. Some say that China is the locomotive of the world economy. Uh, we don't necessarily subscribe to that, but it's clear that China has a very important role to play on the world economy. But on the other hand, 
as a world model. Oh, that's a different story. Because as you understand, we believe in democracy. We believe in human rights. We believe in the rule of law. And we believe in Western values. We have fought for this over the years, over history. So we appreciate the role of China and the world economy. But on the other hand, we project our own model for the world, for the future generations to come. And if I may say so, in the future, maybe China would also accept those values as more useful for, for its own society. Of course, that's for China to decide. But also for us, we have our own model and we cherish our democracies and our, and our human rights uh, in a way that sometimes the Chinese example is not exactly compatible with our way of living. Mr. Minister, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. Thank, thank you. This was a great pleasure and a great honor. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Ian Brzezinski, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all for joining us today at the EU-US Future Forum. Many thanks to our colleagues, the delegation of the European Union to the United States for partnering with the Atlantic Council on this major three-day conference and to all the teams who worked tirelessly to put this impressive event together. I'm honored to host this session. It's titled In Dialogue, a conversation with the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome. It's an honor to have you with us today. I want to thank you for your leadership and tireless energy on behalf of the U.S.-Polish relationship and the transatlantic community. In today's session, we're eager to discuss with you transatlantic multilateral cooperation, the opportunities and challenges before this community of nations, and of course, the role of Poland. Before we begin, I want to encourage our audience to engage us on social media using the hashtag, hashtag EUFF2021. That's hashtag EUFF2021. Mr. Prime Minister, allow us to begin by addressing perhaps the most immediate challenge before the transatlantic community, the human and economic toll caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This pandemic has tested the transatlantic community's ability to respond together to a devastating and at times divisive challenge. It has tested our economies. It has tested our unity. How do you, as Prime Minister of Poland, assess the U.S.-European response to the medical and health consequences of this pandemic? Thank you, Yeah, Thanks for having me. And um, th thank you for being able to take floor in this very interesting conference. Mm, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last year, last 12 months or so, were the most difficult over the previous at least three decades for uh, transatlantic relationship for, for Europe, for, for the United States, and exactly this, is, this was because of COVID-19. Uh, given our democracy and democratic systems and the uh, will for freedom and, and um, the way of life, uh, it was not so easy to respond, to reply to this, uh, to this dreadful, terrible disease, um, pandemic. And this is why also our economies were hit very, very badly over the past uh, 12 months. Uh, we were uh, actually able, on the level of the European Council, where I sit, and with the United States, to um, actually keep our regulations and the uh, level of um, the trade and, and the dialogue around uh, taxation uh, on an appropriate level. There, was, there were attempts to go into the trade war, for instance, but we were able to fend off those uh, threats and, and this was this was on the positive side on the more on the less so less positive it was the reply of our healthcare systems and i mean our like in the almost the whole of the european union and in the united states it was not prepared appropriately for the pandemic as uh, as 
such 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 terrible pandemic as uh, COVID-19. And with this uh, thought uh, in Europe, we have prepared a resilience and recovery plan, 750 billion uh, euros, close to one trillion dollars, on top of one point. $3 trillion uh, budget for next uh, several years, EU budget uh, for um, recovery purposes, for investment purposes, infrastructure, and so on. So uh, this, uh, this is still not yet activated given the procedures, and there, there, there is this difference between Europe um, and the United States that uh, in the U.S., given it's one state, um, it can, the decision-making process is easier. It takes a little bit longer here in Europe, but we were able um, over the past couple of months to agree on the most important priorities exactly in the context of uh, COVID-19 healthcare systems and how to improve them in the context of a pandemic, the, the question which Ian asked me at the beginning. Um, just yesterday, the Polish Parliament has passed the bill, uh, or, or the lower chamber of the Parliament, I should have said, uh, of the bill of re recovery and resilience uh, fund. And at the, at the beginning of the uh, second half, uh, second half year, uh, um, we will start uh, strong investment uh, projects in uh, in many different areas including healthcare, of, of course, but also significant amount of money is earmarked for um, the Green Deal uh, projects, uh, digitization projects, uh, infrastructure, hard infrastructure development, including this, which is going to build a, a new dimension or, or relatively new dimension, three Cs dimension, the Baltic Sea, the Adriatic Sea, and the Black Sea. Um, the, 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 this, this is with the view to activate the north-south uh, connectivity in Europe. Uh, post Second World War, Poland and uh, a dozen of uh, Central European countries were left on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, and we were very much underdeveloped from the point of view of infrastructure and, and business opportunities. Mm, uh, in this part of Europe. But last decade or so, or last two, two decades, we are catching up very, very quickly. Just to give you an example, uh, for, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, Poland has surpassed Greece and Portugal from uh, GDP per capita uh, in purchasing power parity uh, criterion. Uh, and, and there are many other um, ratios, including the re unemployment ratio, I can give you another, another example. Just 15 years ago, 1-5, Poland was the country with one of the highest unemployment levels in Europe, in the whole Europe. Today, we have the lowest unemployment level in the whole, of, uh, in, the, in the European Union, which is an indicator of what uh, road we went through over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, in summary, uh, the whole Europe is aware of our weakness, uh, given the, um, the turbulence uh, around pandemic. But uh, beginning the third quarter of this year, we will very strongly start uh, investing in investment, increasing productivity in particular. And this is this is why I, where, where I believe that the transatlantic cooperation should should be very uh, could be very helpful and vital in the joint and harmonized recovery of the Western uh, Hemisphere. You spoke about the EU's response. You spoke a bit about your strategy uh, to help Poland dig itself out of this economic trench that the coronavirus pandemic has created. How satisfied are you with transatlantic economic collaboration? in addressing the economic dimensions of, of this pandemic. Cooperation between the United States and the European Union, between the United States and you know, the states of, uh, of, of, of Europe. I'm, I'm not uh, as happy as I, I, I'd, I'd like to be because it's, uh, the, the, we, we have the same system of values. We have almost the same interests vis-a-vis -vis huge 
challenges looming on the horizon like Russia, like international terrorism, like China, another pandemic behind the corner potentially, or, the, or at least the fourth wave threatening all of us. These are global challenges, challenges around climate change, challenges around inequalities, and we should tackle those um, jointly. Uh, having said that, uh, let me emphasize one point, which might be interesting for you. Uh, I, I believe Poland and, and Poles are the most uh, pro-American and pro-European citizens at the same time. There might be more pro-American Americans, uh, there might be even more pro-European EU citizens than po Polish people, but, uh, but Pol Polish people uh, have at the same time huge admiration and love to, uh, to the United States and the European Union uh, at the same time. This, this means that we could be uh, a very important keystone uh, integral, uh, integrating um, uh, component of our transatlantic construction. And with this in mind, uh, back to your question, Ian, uh, am I satisfied? I, I believe that this new dimension which we have created together with other countries of Central Europe called three C's is still uh, underestimated by our friends in the United States. Yes, there was this promise by Mr. Pompeo, I, I think it was in Munich, uh, the former President Trump have said this is important and they, they promised to chip in uh, some money, $1 billion. Uh, it's, it's, it's neither here nor there. $1 billion for Poland is not big amount of money anymore and it's, it's tiny amount of money for the United States anyway. Uh, and, and yet this part of the world, this part of Europe is, uh, is the eastern flank of NATO, is the eastern flank of the United Europe. And, and this is why we, we are uh, um, defending our, the world of our values and we are taking the heat of uh, unpleasant uh, hybrid attacks from Russia on Ukraine, on Poland, on, U on Ukraine, by the way, it's of course the physical attack, assault on, on in the Donbas area and occupation of the Crimean Peninsula. But we are also experiencing the, the very bad um, uh, developments recently in Belarus. And, and this is where uh, I, we also uh, see the United States quite absent. And, and I believe that this is, the, 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 the three C's platform and the friendly uh, approach which we have in Poland towards the United States and the European Union, friendly is too, too soft a word, is means uh, underutilizing the opportunity of enhanced cooperation and building a strong presence of the US in this part uh, of the world. Um, Yes, there is this presence of the some some of the of the American troops and some of American business, but we have other countries uh, from Europe which are much bigger investors and which are present here uh, to to a, to a larger degree than the United States. The United States is is our uh, is our fourth biggest trading partner from outside of the EU. So including EU, I, I don't know, it would be number 10 or number 12, uh, far behind our um, smaller, much, much smaller neighbors. So I regret that this dimension of our cooperation is not um, utilized uh, to a level uh, to which it, it should be. Uh, and, and I would strongly encourage all, all my own American friends and, and business people to, uh, to come to Poland uh, for, for both reasons. One is, of course, for business reasons, to make money. But another one is to, to enhance the ties, between the bonds between um, the Euro uh, European Union and the United States. Critically important for the future. Prime Minister, let me pull a thread on the Three Seas Initiative. For our viewers who don't know what that is, that is a significant effort led by the Poles in cooperation with other Central European countries to accelerate the development of cross-border energy transport and digital infrastructure. It's all about completing Europe. 
Mr. Prime Minister, you know, the United States and the European Union have both considered infrastructure development as a key element of their respective economic recovery strategies. Uh, you've highlighted the three C's as part of your strategy. Could you explain with our to, to our audience why you think the three C strategy will succeed? Why it will be effective in attracting uh, private capital to develop this infrastructure in the region? What makes Poland, what makes Central Europe appealing and attractive to foreign direct investment? But depending on uh, how the, you would define Central Europe, it's between 150 to 200 million population and with, with the, the uh, pace of change, economic growth, um, the healthy development of our um, financial system and, um, uh, and, and, and um, um, good, uh, stable social environment. Um, is altogether a very, very attractive business platform and strategic platform to jump onto for many businesses. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to uh, Sundar Pichai from Google. They are going to invest two and a half billion dollars uh, in, spe in special uh, cloud, in cloud uh, technology here in Poland. A week ago, I spoke to Michael Dell, uh, and they are considering some further investment here in Poland as well. And uh, the, the reason why it might be over the next decade or two, extremely interesting for American uh, entrepreneurs and this part of the world is that we, we are the gate for the European Union, uh, 500 million or uh, together with the UK, 500 million plus a population, one of the richest uh, regions in the world. Uh, and in particular, this lung, as, the, as it was uh, uh, John Paul II mentioned about the Central Europe and Western Europe, the second lung of, the, of Europe, this lung is uh, developing at uh, uh, two times or three times pace of Western Europe. So it's, it's good to capture this, this growth. Um, it is also in the process of building north, south, uh, infrastructure in the area of energy, uh, digital roads, railways, um, and 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 all other um, uh, infrastructure projects. So so many companies, experienced companies, could uh, take advantage of this of those developments which we for which we have money and which we plan for next couple of decades. I'm focusing on the social dimension, healthy economic environment. A good um, uh, business environment, but also there is this additional transatlantic and strategic relationship. I'm sure many of you are interested in as well. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm a big fan of the Three Seas Initiative. I think it's a real expression of Central European self-confidence and a real effort and self-initiative by the Central Europeans to bring geoeconomic value to the transatlantic community. But Mr. Prime Minister, the pandemic is not the only challenge before our, our community of democracies. Mm -hmm. Russia recently escalated fighting in eastern Ukraine. Moscow has amassed a significant offensive force and occupied Crimea along, and along Ukraine's eastern frontier, and it sealed off the Sea of Azov. Are you satisfied with NATO's and the European Union's response to these offensive military actions by Russia? Do you think that the West's response to this crisis has caused Putin to adjust his ambitions regarding Ukraine? Or should we be expecting more provocative actions in the future from Moscow? Unfortunately, I think that we should expect more provocative actions because our response was not decisive enough. Uh, only the last couple of days, our Czech friends, our Czech southern neighbors discovered that there, there were the same uh, Russian spies behind a uh, big terrorist attack on a Czech soil uh, who were active on, on the British soil um, poisoning Skripal uh, in Salisbury attack, attack a couple of years ago. Uh, there is the case of Mr. Navalny. There are constant fights in the eastern part of Ukraine. And then there is a creeping uh, occupation of Belarus 
uh, and uh, lots of hybrid attacks, which you, some of them even in, are experienced in, in the United States. But you can imagine how many more are experienced in this part of the world, given the proximity to Russia and their enormous power. Yet Russia is, might, might be, uh, you know, fend off and threatened also only um, uh, by uh, our decisive response. And what it means, it means uh, the presence of NATO troops in uh, eastern flank of uh, NATO, that's, that's one, but also a very uh, decisive diplomatic uh, uh, reply uh, from Brussels, from uh, Washington and, other, and from, from, the, from the capitals of the European Union. Um, the sanctions which we are extending every six months are, uh, are working to some extent, but they should be uh, enhanced because um, this is where the real interest, this is how the real interests of uh, Russia uh, can be, um, uh, can be um, addressed, so to say. There is, there is one, uh, however, symbolic and not, not only symbolic, but it is symbolic at this juncture, not only symbolic, but very much strategic and, and business related um, political act, which is in, in statu nascendi, it's, it's, being in, it's in progress. And this is Nord Stream 2. This is a gas pipeline um, being built between Russia and Germany, um, which, is, which goes completely um, uh, across all the interests of NATO and the European Union. We were trying to persuade our German or dissuade our German uh, neighbors um, this project, and we were we were calling for uh, for uh, closing this project. But the real uh, power uh, is now in the hands of the United States. It's it is still possible to stop this very uh, bad political project, which will give the give additional blackmail instruments in the hands of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, blackmail uh, instruments vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Moldova, Poland, Belarus, the Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, and even Austria and the others. Um, uh, so uh, this is this short-sighted uh, view of our German uh, neighbors uh, and uh, uh, which and, and and the will of Russia, which make this pro uh, this project uh, progressing still, but it's not yet finished. It's by far not yet finished, and over the next couple of months, we still have chances to to stop it and to send a very strong signal of solidarity and transatlantic will um, to the rest of the world. Mr. Prime Minister, we're almost at the end of our time, so allow me to just throw one last broad question to you. You know, Russia, of course, is a challenge, but the United, Sta but the United States and Europe now have to contend not only with an increasingly ro volatile Russia, but also a China that is increasingly assertive. This will be a big issue at the upcoming NATO summit in, in June. What responsibilities, in your view, should Europe have in the West strategy to address an increasingly assertive China? And do you see a role for Poland? Well, I was very vocal uh, on many meetings of the European Council, which is the um, regular gathering of heads of states and, and governments in, in the European Union, uh, about 5G, about uh, job parties coming from Far East, from China in particular. Of course, we want to cooperate with China as uh, the United States uh, do and, and the other countries. Uh, want to do this, but um, we don't. We want to avoid uh, overdependency of, of on, on China uh, on, on Chinese technology, and we are very aware of the risks coming from from this direction. This is why we built the Three Cs Initiative, which is completely in harmony with the European Union, with the objectives of Transatlantic Security uh, Conference. And at the same time, it's strengthening our 
uh, identity and strengthening our economic power vis-a-vis -vis China. China is uh, trying to enter exactly the same zone through the initiative through other initiatives. One of them is 17 plus one. China is buying the, the, the harbors like Piraeus next to Athens in Greece uh, and in other places all over Europe because they are using the enormous power of state to, uh, to, um, uh, to enter into, in, into this part of Europe, which is less developed. This is exactly why the investments from the United States uh, at this juncture is so much needed uh, also to stop not only the Russian um, aggression, uh, but also uh, more silent, but equally, equally challenging uh, Chinese policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis this part of the world. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for sharing your views on the coronavirus pandemic, the challenges posed to transatlantic community by, by Russia and China, and for underscoring Poland's important role in this community of democracies. Yeah, and thank you very much, and, and thank you all the board of the, of, of the Atlantic Council and uh, all people who are uh, trying to get closer the United States to the European Union. You're doing a great job, and this is what the Europe and, uh, and the United States and the free world needs just now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and to you, Mr. Prime Minister. Yet another in-depth and detailed panel to wrap up our day, sparking numerous conversation points about the many angles of the transatlantic relationship. Maggie, it's been a full day too. What struck you during the numerous dialogues we just heard? I was particularly struck by the emphasis on the opportunity we have coming out of the pandemic to work together to promote a green economic recovery, and in doing so, making more significant progress on solving the climate crisis. Both the EU and the US have recently made ambitious commitments that underline the shared priorities in solving this challenge of the century. As Laura Rosenberger mentioned this morning, democracy delivers. We will come out of this pandemic stronger and more closely aligned in the EU-US relationship. And as you just said, amidst all of this, amidst all of these topics, all of these viewpoints, all of these potential roadmaps for the future, the emphasis for transatlantic cooperation has remained prevalent in every discussion. From economic recovery to trade, from China to space, from green transition to the green future, this day two of the EU-US Future Forum has built upon the foundational arguments that were laid out in day one. If the past was built upon cooperation, the future is too. We heard from everybody, from cabinet secretaries to commissioners to senators stress this point and articulate that we are in a time of global challenge, but the European Union and the United States will both emerge stronger if working alongside one another. And as you just mentioned, Travis, day one of the EU-US Future Forum reflected on the history of the transatlantic relationship, examining the roots of our friendship and collaboration. Day two explored our various approaches to today's challenges, ranging from COVID to climate. And on day three, we will, as the forum's title says, look to the future, discussing the many things the EU and US can achieve when acting together in the world. You can view tomorrow's agenda, and catch up on the recordings of all of these sessions on the Atlantic Council website at atlanticcouncil.org and in the EUFF event app. Be sure to share your highlights from today's dialogue on social media using the hashtag EUFF2021. And be sure to join us for our third and final day tomorrow morning. From the Atlantic, Ca from the Atlantic Council headquarters in Washington, DC, we wish you a good day to those of you in the United States and a good evening to our friends in Europe. Thank you for joining.